I welcome today's speaker, Dr. R. K. Singh and Dr. B. D. Singh, who joined us online, and also welcome Dr. V. P. Sahi and Dr. Abi Nazir Hyde on the dais. Now I would like to welcome conveners of the session, Dr. Firoz Hussain and Dr. Kiran Gaikwad. Dr. Narendra Saini and Dr. Niharika and Ms. Harshita will serve as a reporters of today's session. I would now request Dr. A. K. Singh, Director. Div Director IARI to welcome the chairman and co-chairman with a bouquet of flowers. Now I I would request Dr. A K Singh to welcome the speaker with a bouquet of flowers. I request convener, convener Dr. Firoz Hussain to introduce our chairman and co-chairman of today's session. Thank you. A very good afternoon to all the delegates and participants. I, on behalf of the, I, on behalf of the organizers, and also on my personal behalf as convener. Once again, welcome the esteemed chair, Professor P.K. Gupta, sir, to this session. We also welcome honorable co-chair, Dr. J.C. Rana, to this session. I welcome the eminent speakers, Dr. R.K. Singh and Professor B.D. Singh, who joins us through online mode. I also welcome the distinguished speakers, Dr. Eben Azir Hyde and Dr. V.P. Sahi, present on the dais. It is indeed a great pleasure and honor for me to introduce to you the chairman of today's session, Professor Pushpender Kumar Gupta. Professor Gupta needs no introduction to this august audience full of geneticists, plant breeders, molecular biologists, biotechnologists, and most importantly, the students. However, it is my present duty to introduce to you some of his impressive achievements during his illustrious career. Professor P.K. Gupta is currently the honorary emeritus professor at the Department of Genetics and Plant Breeding at Chaudhary Charan Singh University, Merit. Professor P.K. Gupta started his professional career at Merit College in 1958-59 and DAV College, Muzaffarnagar in 1959-60, and later served as the lecturer at Gorakhpur University during 1960-69. He joined Merit University in 1969, where he first served as reader, then professor in the Department of Agriculture, Botany, now known as Department of Genetics and Plant Breeding. Later, he served as a Dean Faculty of Agriculture till his retirement in December, 1996. After his retirement from the active service, he continued working at Merit University in various capacities, like Emeritus Professor for Life, CSIR Emeritus Scientist, UGC Emeritus Fellow, INSA Senior Scientist, INSA Honorary Scientist, and NASI Senior Scientist. His area of research involved almost all areas of plant genetics and plant breeding, including cytogenetics, biometrical genetics, mutation research, quantitative genetics, molecular marker technology, and crop biotechnology. He has authored more than two dozens of textbooks on genetics and plant biotechnology, which are widely popular among the university student. He has published over 400 research articles and mentored nearly 100 PhD students. Professor Gupta is a fellow of Indian National Science Academy, New Delhi, National Academy of Science, Allahabad, Indian Academy of Sciences, Bangalore, and National Academy of Agriculture Sciences, New Delhi. Professor Gupta is decorated with many prestigious awards, which includes Birbal Sahani Gold Medal by Indian Botanical Society. I, on behalf of the organizer, once again, thank Chairman Sir for agreeing to our request for chairing this session. It is equally a great pleasure for me to introduce to you the co-chair of this session, Dr. J.C. Rana. Dr. Jai Chand Rana is, is the country representative 
and the national coordinator, UN Environmental GF Project, the Alliance of Biodiversity International, and see at India Office, New Delhi. Earlier, Dr. Rana joined ICR National Bureau of Plant Genetic Resources, New Delhi, a scientist in 1991. Later, Dr. Rana headed the division of germplasm evaluation at ICR NBPGR during 2015 to 17. His area of research includes the plant genetic resource management, on-farm conservation, and climate change. He is the fellow of National Academy of Agriculture Sciences and various scientific societies like Indian Society of Genetics and Plant Breeding and Indian Society of Plant Genetic Resources. Dr. Rana is decorated with various prestigious awards like NAS Recognition Award, Dr. B.R. Barwale Award, ICRMS Swaminathan Award for Outstanding Research on Heal Agriculture, and the ICR UNDP Fellowship. I thank you, sir, for agreeing to our request to co-chair this session. Now I request the chair, sir, to please conduct the session. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity of chairing this session. A very important meeting for me because I have already practiced and taught genetics for the last more than 60 years. And I must tell you that I enjoyed teaching genetics every moment during these last 60 years. It also resulted in publication of a number of books which are widely read, like those of Dr. B.D. Singh, who is another speaker this afternoon. These, the, we have decided that the first two speakers I will introduce, and the next two speakers, my co-chair, Dr. J.C. Rana, will, will introduce and, and organize. Also because the first two speakers I have known for a long time, and therefore I can talk about them a little bit. Dr. Ram Katan Singh, most of you may not know, I have known him ever since he returned from Germany after doing his PhD and joined Merit University along with Professor R.B. Singh as pool officer. And he was known at that time to be an important person in the country in biomedical genetics which is also evident from the fact that he wrote a book on manual of biometrical genetics, which I used to consult by solving problems of biometrical genetics for our PhD students. That was the only book available at that time, and he never subjected to any revision, unfortunately. But talking about the career of Dr. Ram Kathir Singh, he did his BSc and MSc from Agriculture College, Kanpur. Mm -hmm. studying first in order of merit, and then he did his PhD from Germany, Rostock University, Germany. From and as I told you, after returning from Germany, he was a very brief period. He was at Merit University with us as a pool officer. We missed him because he left after quite a few months. He got a job at Haryana Agriculture University, where he was for long years, first as associate professor, and then as a professor. And then, in the 80s, he shifted to Fezabad Agriculture University as Dean, uh, College of Agriculture, and he stayed there for about another 30 years and superintended from there for established sometime in 2007 and continues to organize this organization ever since then. Ram Katil Singh likes to speak in Hindi. His program is Ishaki K. Prasam Sopan. So he's going to tell us about genetics. In Hindi, we'll also listen some poetry from him because he is very fond of writing poems. He has also published a book on the poet, poems which he has written. So we will definitely enjoy his his presentation, a novel presentation, because it is going to be in Hindi and a little bit poetic. The second speaker also I can introduce, because we can then listen to both of them in continuation. Dr. Brahmadev Singh, I have known him almost uh, last 50 years now, 1970s when he returned from, uh, from Canada after doing his PhD ever since then. And Professor R.B. Singh was Professor and head, I attended a conference in Bangladesh University, and there he was introduced 
is an important treatment because in tissue culture he was he just came from later on you was seen from his from his bio data that in 1965 he graduated did his bsc from allahabad university then msc in 1967 from kanpur university and then his phd from university of saskatchewan 1972 perhaps not from from the science, from the crop science department perhaps he was in botany department if i am correct because he worked on tissue culture there not really in plant breeding but nevertheless, he was one of the most important person in the field of tissue culture. And then at Banaras Hindu University, he worked for a number of years in the genetics and plant breeding department, and then shifted to School of Biotechnology later on, and there continued for the rest of his life before he superannuated. After superannuation, or before superannuation, he was also rector of the university. I, Remember, I visited as a member of UGC team along with Professor R.B. Singh to monitor the program. At that time, he really looked after us because he was the rector at that particular time. A rector position in Banaras University is an, is an important position. And most importantly, students of genetics and plant breeding know him by his books on genetics and plant breeding. And I must tell you that my publisher asked me a number of times to write a book on plant breeding and I thought I should not because I cannot compete with the book written by, by Dr. B.D. Singh. So his books are very popular. Also because many students think that he writes in a language which is easily understandable by the students. And my books are perhaps a little more difficult to understand because uh, the English is a different. Style of writing, uh, both of us are, are different, and therefore we both have been writing books regularly. I started writing in 1973. He started writing sometimes in 1980 or or after that. He also published a book with Ashok Kumar Singh. I remember from Springer, very important book on what is the title of the book, Ashok? Yes. And so you you know that Dr. Baldev Singh. Uh, Brahmadev Singh is known to the students of plant breeding and genetics and, and the book on plant breeding I also consulted once in a time whenever I need, need some important information. So these two speakers unfortunately could not attend in person and therefore they decided to uh, give their lectures online and I am I'm sure you will enjoy these two lectures and the next two lectures my co-chair and we'll look after. Thank, thank you very much. So with this, uh, Brief introduction. I like to invite Dr. Ram Kathan Singh to give his presentation. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Am I audible? Hello. Hello. Should I be there? You are audible, sir. Okay, thank you very much. You are audible, sir. Okay, thank you. I thank Dr. Uh, inviting me to podium and thus making it possible to uh, see a number of people. I am seeing Dr. But I'm so happy to see him in such a good health. I hardly see any change in him. The guard seems to be very kind to him. Uh, I have been, I'm supposed to speak about my book, Anubanski Ke Patam Surpan. Actually, uh, 
what Dr. Ashok uh, exactly wanted from me, I don't know. But anyway, to me, it, uh, it's a great surprise that uh, he has put me as a speaker before such an enlightened audience uh, that too on a very trivial topic. Friends, I shall not be talking any science to you. So you may be disappointed on that account. Uh, I shall be talking about my book, Anubanski Ke Pratham Tupan, uh, which is a genetic uh, poetic presentation of uh, the Mendelian genetics. It took uh, scientists like Hugo Debris, Carl Corrins, and Van Sarmak a hundred years to rediscover Mendelian findings. And Dr. So took 50 years to recover, to uh, rediscover my book, this Anuvansi Ke Pratham Thopan. Kari pachas saal pahle mene ye kitab likhi thi, tab mein Haryana Kishi Vishwit Jale mein Janajit Vibhag mein associate pohutar tha. Uh, then and even now, I don't consider this as any scientific contribution worth considering or remembering. But today, since Dr. Ashok has brought this small publication into focus, I'm forced to, pay, to say a few words about it. Sabal ye ye kitab likhi kyon gayi thi? बहुत से लोगों ने हिंदी में या दूसरी इंडियन लैंग्वेजेस में किताब लिखी है मैंने भी लिखी है पर इस किताब के लिखने के पीछे एक छोटी सी कहानी है भारत सरकार के वैज्ञानिक एवं तकनीकी शब्दावली आयोग की एक हिंदी की समिति थी यह है और मैं उसका सदस्य था कि 1972-73 की बात है और उस इस आयोग के दो उद्देश्य थे एक तो हिंदी में या लोकल जो इंडियन लैंग्वेजेस में तकनीकी और वैज्ञानिक शब्दावली का को विकसित करना और दूसरा uh, English authored books, जो scientist science की थी, उनको हिंदी में translate करना. Frankly speaking, मैं दोनों के खिलाफ था. जहाँ तक तकनीकी शब्दों का सवाल था, मेरा मतलब ये है कि अगर हिंदी में लिखना हो, तो आप जो अंग्रेजी के जो तकनीकी के शब्द हैं, असच्च आप प्रयोग कर सकते हैं. उनको हिंदी में translate करने की कोई जरूरत नहीं है. और दूसरा अनुवाद के मैं बिल्कुल खिलाफ था मेरा आर्गुमेंट था कि हमको ओरिजिनल या मौलिक किताबें लिखवानी चाहिए क्योंकि कई बार जो अनुवाद की किताबें होती हैं वो अंग्रेजी से भी मुश्किल हो जाती है मैंने देखा भी है बहुत सारी किताबें इसके ऊपर बहुत बहस होती है जो हमारे साथ अन्य वैज्ञानिक थे वो सीधे सीधे एक बात करते थे कि इंडियन लैंग्वेजेस आर नॉट आर नॉट इन ए पोजीशन दे आर नॉट इन दे आर आर दे आर इनकैपेबल ऑफ बीइंग यूज्ड एज वर्किंग लैंग्वेज आर मीडियम ऑफ इंस्ट्रक्शन फॉर पर्टिकुलरली फॉर साइंस इन यूनिवर्सिटीज एंड कॉलेजेस मतलब आप अपनी मातृभाषा में साइंस पढ़ और पढ़ा नहीं सकते यह बात मेरी समझ में नहीं आती और आज भी नहीं आती है शायद आप लोगों में से भी बहुत लोग समझ सकते होंगे कि जो बात अपनी मातृभाषा में कह सकते हैं वो दूसरी बात दूसरी भाषा में कभी भी उतनी अच्छी तरह से नहीं कहा जा सकता न लिखा जा सकता है न पढ़ा जा सकता है मैं इस बात को मानने के लिए कतई तैयार नहीं था कि हिंदी में हिंदी के माध्यम से साइंस को पढ़ाया लिखाया नहीं जा सकता 
एक बार बहुत झगड़ा सा हुआ था उस मीटिंग में और वहां से लौट के आने के बाद मेरा मन बहुत खिन्न था मैं ये सोच रहा था कि मैं ऐसा क्या कर सकता हूँ जिससे मैं इन लोगों को साबित कर सकूं कि हमारी जो इंडियन लैंग्वेजेस हैं वो इतनी सक्षम हैं कि उनमें आप उस, उसके माध्यम से आप साइंस या कोई भी विज्ञान उसमें पढ़ा लिखा सकते हैं तभी मैंने मेरे दिमाग में आया था कि मैं हिंदी में एक किताब लिखूंगा और उन दिनों यद्यपि मैं बायोमेट्रिकल जेनेटिक्स ऑफ ऑपरेशन जनरिक पढ़ाता था लेकिन मैं जब से जर्मनी से लौट के आया था तब से जेनेटिक्स का जो बेसिक कोर्स था थ्री नाट वन वो मैं बी एस सी ए जी को पढ़ाया करता था तो मैंने सोचा कि उसी को मैं हिंदी में लिखूं पर हिंदी में किताब लिखने का कोई खास मतलब इसलिए नहीं लगा मुझे कि ये तो कोई बड़ी बात हुई नहीं और उसी समय मेरे दिमाग में आया कि क्यों ना मैं इसे कविता में लिख दू क्योंकि मुझे बचपन से कविता में लिखने का की कला मालूम थी मैं कविताएं लिख लेता था तब तक मेरी कई किताबें हिंदी कविता की छप चुकी थी तो मुझे कविता लिखने में कोई दिक्कत नहीं थी और भाषा को मैं मैं जानता था कि हमारी भाषा इतनी सक्षम है कि हम इसके माध्यम से कविता लिख सकते हैं ये ठीक है कि विज्ञान को इतना सरल और सरल सरस नहीं होता और कविता के लिए भाषा बिल्कुल सरस और सरल चाहिए तो मैं यही दिखाना चाहता था कि हिंदी में गद्य में लिखने की बात क्या है हिंदी में आप कविता में भी लिख सकते हैं चाहे साइंस जैसा विषय कोई कठिन क्यों ना हो उसको भी आप लिख सकते हैं सबसे पहले मैंने एक दस बारह पेज का एक आलेख एक निबंध तैयार किया एक साइनाप्सिस बनाया और मैंने किताब में सोचा था कि ये साइनाप्सिस बारह पेज का एक आलेख दूंगा और फिर उसकी कविता में कविता में लिख करके उसको दू फिर मेरे समझ में आया कि आलेख पढ़ने में कई लोगों को आलेख सीरियस लगता है और वो भी साइंस का आलेख हिंदी में शायद पढ़ने में लोगों को मजा ना आए तो क्यों ना उसको कहानी में लिख दिया जाए तो सबसे पहले मैंने एक कहानी लिखी करीब दस बारह पेज की और उस कहानी के माध्यम से मैं पूरा मेंडेलियन जो जेनेटिक्स का जो घटना चक्र है उसको मैंने लिख दिया तो मुझे ऐसा लगता था कि कहानी पढ़ते पढ़ते आप कोई भी बद बहुत आसानी से मेंडेलियन जेनेटिक्स को समझ जाएगा और कहानी एक ऐसी चीज है कि जब आप पढ़ना शुरू करेंगे तो शायद उसको बन नहीं करेंगे वो उसमें मजा आता जाता है और उसको आप अंत तक उसको पढ़ेंगे तो सबसे पहले मैंने उसको कहानी में लिखा और फिर मैंने उसको कविता में लिखा अब मैं और ज्यादा इसको विस्तार में ना जा करके मैं सोचता हूं कि मैं जो कहानी है उसके एक दो पैराग्राफ आपको सुनाता हूं जिससे आपको पता लगे कि ये किस तरह से लिखा गया है और फिर मैं जो इसमें जो कविता का अंश है उससे मैं थोड़ा बहुत आपको सुना सुनाता हूँ और, और फिर जिससे आपको लगे कि भाई किस तरह की कविता लिखी गई है और क्या यह इस कविता के माध्यम से मैं अपनी बात कह पाने में सक्षम हूं या नहीं कहानी का शीर्षक था मिंडल का स्वप्न ड्रीम्स ऑफ मिंडल आप याद करिए मिंडल ने अपना काम कर लिया है और उसको उनको ऑस्ट्रिया ब्रुन में ऑस्ट्रिया की नेचुरल हिस्ट्री सोसाइटी के विद्वानों के सामने उसको प्रेजेंट कर रहा है वहां से कहानी शुरू होती है आठ फरवरी अठारह ब्रुन ऑस्ट्रिया के नेचुरल हिस्ट्री सोसाइटी का हाल खचाखच भरा हुआ था वैज्ञानिकों की इस भीड़ में जान ग्रेगर मेंडल बिल्कुल अलग दिख रहा था सबसे अलग वह ज्ञान का सच्चा साधक और सही मायनों में पुजारी था पैंसठ वर्ष की आय में भी उसके चेहरे की दमक अपने संभैसकों से कहीं बहुत तेज थी जिंदगी भर अपनी साधना में लीन ब्रह्मचर्य जीवन बिताने वाला वह साध आज बहुत खुश नजर आ रहा था उसका चौड़ा माथा सिर के बालों के गिर जाने से और भी चौड़ा लग रहा था उसने पादरियों वाला लंबा 
सफेद चोंगा पहन रखा था उसके गले में ईसा की मोहर युक्त माला लटक रही थी सबकी निगाहें उस पर टिकी थी वैज्ञानिकों की भीड़ में इस भीड़ में वैज्ञानिकों की सभा में एक साधु संभवतः यही प्रश्न सबके मन में मन में कौज रहा था लेकिन इस सब से बेखबर वह अपने चिंतन में निमग्न उसके पास ही निमग्न बैठा था उसके पास ही बैठा था उसका आत्मीय सहायक ओल्फ्राम ओल्फ्राम कुछ घबराया घबराया सा लग रहा था इन संभ्रांत वैज्ञानिकों की भीड़ में उसे अच्छा नहीं लग रहा था ऐसा उसके चेहरे से स्पष्ट झलक रहा था उसके लिए मानो एक एक क्षण भी काटना मुश्किल हो रहा था सभापत के आते ही सभा प्रारंभ हुई औपचारिकताओं के बाद सभापत ने घोषणा की अब मैं आज के प्रमुख वक्ता जान गिरिगर मंडल से निवेदन करता हूं वे अपनी शोध पत्र का पत्र सभा के समक्ष प्रस्तुत करें इतना कहकर वो सभापत ने अपना स्थान ग्रहण किया उधर जान ग्रेगर मंडल अपने सहायक से सभी आवश्यक पत्राद लेकर मंच की ओर चल पड़े सब शांत थे सबकी निगाहें उस पुजारी की ओर थी क्या कहेगा ये पुजारी क्या बताएगा ये पुजारी सब लोग सब लोग उसे ससंकित भ्रमित से देख रहे थे जान के संबोधनात्मक शब्दों से अस्तब्धता भंग हुई वह बोल रहे थे बाकी सब एकाग्रचित होकर सुन रहे थे किंतु ओल्फ्राम का ओल्फ्राम का मानो रक्तचाप रक्तचाप बढ़ गया था उसकी सांस लेने की गति तीव्र हो गई थी उसके माथे पर पसीना स्पष्ट झलक रहा था उसकी निगाह अपने देवता पर टिकी थी बहुत देर तक वह कुछ समझ न सका किंतु थोड़ी देर बाद जब वह कुछ आश्वस्त हुआ तो उसे अपने देवता के सब सुनाई पड़े वे अपने उन्हीं प्रयोगों की चर्चा कर रहे थे जो उन्होंने बटन के पौधों पर किए किए थे ओल्फ्राम न जाने कब फिर अतीत के गर्भ में हो गया फिर ये पूरी कहानी ओल्फ्राम और मेंडल के बीच वार्तालाप के रूप में संवाद के रूप में प्रस्तुत की गई कई तरह के सवाल पूछता है ओल्फ्राम और उसके जवाब देते हैं जैसे वो एक सवाल पूछता है कि सर आप फूलों से क्या बातें करते हैं मैं फूलों से थोड़ी देर तक चुप रहने के बाद मेंडल ने कहा फूलों से उनकी सुंदरता उनकी मोहकता उनकी विविधता का राज जानना चाहता हूं किंतु वे मेरे इन प्रश्नों के उत्तर में हंस भर देते हैं मुझे कई बार ऐसा लगता है जैसे वे मेरी खिल्ली उड़ा रहे हों और कह रहे हों अरे तुम तो ईश्वर भक्त हो पुजारी हो ईश्वर की खोज में लगे हो आखिर ईश्वर क्या है सत्य की खोज का नाम ही तो ईश्वर है तो फिर क्यों नहीं कर लेते इस राज के पीछे छिपे सत्य की खोज इतना कहकर वह फिर चुप हो गए उल्फ्राम स्वयं किसी उलझन में पड़ गया सत्य की खोज ईश्वर बस इतना ही बोल सका था वह हाँ सत्य की खोज ही ईश्वर की पूजा है जो कुछ तुम अपने चारों ओर देखते हो ईश्वर रचित ही तो है किसने बनाए हैं फूलों के ये रंग बिरंगे वतन किसने भरे हैं तितलियों के परे में परों में विविध रंग किसने बनाए हैं ये शक्तिशाली अणु जो संपूर्ण विश्व को क्षण में नष्ट कर दे किसकी देन है ये सूक्ष्म जीवाण जो सारी मानवता को रुग्ण कर दे यह सब ईश्वर की ही तो लीला है इन्हीं रहस्यों का विश्लेषण तो सत्य की खोज है क्योंकि यह सब ईश्वर प्रदत्त है ईश्वर निर्मित है अतः इनकी खोज ईश्वर की ही खोज है इस तरह से ये सब आगे चलता रहता है और मैं एक पैराग्राफ और पढ़ता हूँ और इसके बाद इसको कहानी को बंद करता हूँ ऐसे ही कहानी चलती है मैं केवल उदाहरण के तौर पर आपसे कुछ ये बातें मैं आपको बता रहा हूँ ये बताते हैं उसको कि यही तो बात है पुजारी ने मुस्कुराते हुए कहा वैज्ञानिक सत्य की खोज करता है तो पुजारी भी तो सत्य को ही ढूंढता है इस तरह दोनों ही ईश्वर की खोज में लगे हैं क्योंकि सत्य ही ईश्वर है फिर दोनों में अंतर कहा ईश्वर अनंत है उसके रूप भिन्न भिन्न है 
कौन व्यक्ति उसके किस रूप की ओर आकर्षित होता है उसे किस रहस्य की गहराई में जाकर सच्चाई जानना चाहता है अंतर बस इतना भर है जीव वैज्ञानिक के सत्य की खोज का पहलू भौतिक शास्त्री के खोज के पहलू से भिन्न होना स्वाभाविक है एक जहां जीवित सत्य को ढूंढता है तो दूसरा जड़ता के सत्य को परंतु उद्देश्य दोनों के एक है सत्य की खोज अर्थात ईश्वर की खोज इस तरह से पूरी कहानी कही गई है और इस कहानी के माध्यम से पूरी बिल बिलियन जर्टिस को का इसमें वर्णन किया गया है तो कहने का मतलब ये है मित्रों की जब आप इसको पढ़ेंगे तो आपको लगेगा कि आप कहानी पढ़ रहे हैं और कहानी पढ़ते पढ़ते आप पूरी मेंटलियन जर्नलिस्ट का जितना भी मेंटल के एक्सपेरिमेंट्स हैं उनसे जो डेटा आए हैं उनके जो एक्सप्लेनेशन उनकी व्याख्या है उनके जो रिजल्ट्स हैं सब कुछ आपको इस कहानी के माध्यम से मिल जाएगा और यही कहानी इसी कहानी को मेंडल ने उस ब्रुन सोसाइटी के ब्रुन की सोसाइटी के सामने पढ़ा था अब मैं इसका जो दूसरा पहलू जो कविता का है उसके उदाहरण आपको देता हूं जो कविता का जो खंड है वो छह भागों में बटा हुआ है हर खंड छोटे छोटे खंड हैं और हर हर खंड की शैली अलग है कविता की शैली अलग है कविता कब भाषा कब कविता बन जाती है यह जब आप इसको ध्यान से पढ़ेंगे तब आपको समझ में आएगा जैसे आप देखें एक मेंडल एक परिचय उसका परिचय के जो जो शैली है वो कैसे है कि मेंडल किसी चर्च में था पुजारी प्रकृत रूप सी थी उसे नई प्यारी लगा चर्च के साथ था बाग सुंदर सजे थे जहां पर विविध पौध तरुवर कभी देखता वह बिकसते सुमन को कभी फूल के लाल पीले बसंत को कभी पौध की पत्तियों की सजावट लुभाती कभी भृंग की गुनगुनाहट अधिकतर समय वह बिताता चमन में पनपते विविध प्रश्न मन के गगन में आधार क्या है भला किस तरह से नई पौध में पितृ के रूप भी से कोई पौध छोटी तो कोई बड़ी क्यों डालो द्वार देखिए आप कोई पौध छोटी तो कोई बड़ी क्यों धवल तो कोई है धवल तो कोई लाल है पंखुरी क्यों कोई पुष्प नीला तो है पीत कोई किसी फूल की पाखुरी दूध धोई मटर के किसी बीज हैं गोल सुंदर किसी के मगर बीज विकृत असुंदर लक्षण विविध है तथा अनगिनत है भला बीज में किस तरह से लेत है उसी बीज से किस तरह रूप बोलो नई पौध में आ गए राज खोलो प्रकट हो सकी किस तरह प्रश्न उठता अतुल रूप की रंग की यह विविधता मगर भक्ति थी भावना थी लगन थी उसे सत्य की खोज की एक धुन थी सदा चाहता था कि पहचान पाए विधाता के रूप प्रारूप को जान जाए <coughs> सही था कि वह क्या कर स्वार्थ अपना बना था पुजारी लिए एक सपना प्रभु भी तो पर्याय ही सत्य का है तथा भक्त भी सत्य ही ढूंढता है इसी खोज का नाम विज्ञान दूजा नहीं से बड़ी है कोई और पूजा हुआ ज्ञान का हुआ ज्ञान का अंततः बोध उसको बौद्ध की तरह से हुआ ज्ञान का अंततः बोध उसको पता था किसे की यही शोध उसको बना दे जनक घोष करके बिगुल का अनुबांचकी के नए ज्ञान बिगुल का अनुबांचकी के नए ज्ञान कुल का ये मंडल का परिचय है और इसकी शैली आपने देखी किस तरह की है इस कविता की एक और आपको संदर्भ सुनाता हूं जो है विशुद्धता का सिद्धांत और इसकी शैली देखिए किस तरह से इसकी शैली बिल्कुल अलग है मेंडल के चर्चित प्रयोग की अद्भुत एक कहानी है सुनो सुनाता हूं मैं तुमको मुझको याद जुबानी है पहले तुम सामान्य ज्ञान की बातें तुम्हें बता दू मैं पौधों में भी लिंग भेद होता है यह समझा दू मैं है कुछ सुमन छिपाए रहते नर मादा अपने भीतर 
पर कुछ अलग अलग फूलों में रहते किंतु उसी तर पर देखी तो होगी अवश्य ही देखी तो होगी अवश्य ही पौध पपीते की तुमने कुछ पौधों पर फल लगते हैं किंतु बिना फल भी कितने नर की पौध अलग मादा से पर मादा ही फल देती ले लेकर नर से पराकण जब जब गर्व की होती इसको पर सेचन कहते हैं अलग अलग इसके साधन कभी तितलियां कभी मक्खिया कभी हवा में उड़ते कण किंत किंत साथ ही नर मादा का एक फूल में ही रहना अपने ही नरकण से सेचित होकर नव पीढ़ी जनना नई नहीं यह बात इसे ही स्वयं परागण कहते हैं पौध शास्त्र की हर पुस्तक में छात्र से लिख पढ़ते हैं मटर अनोखी सी मिसाल है स्वयं परागण की विधि की संतति पर इसके प्रभाव को परखें मेंडल की रुचि थी इसके लिए जान मेंडल ने समुचित निम्न प्रयोग किए लाल फूल से अलग धवल के अलग बीज उपयोग किए प्राप्त बीज बौनी पौधों के लंबी से कर लिए बिलग पीली और हली दालों के पौधों से थे बीज अलग 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 फिर बोया उनको अलग अलग काटे दाए अलग अलग पहचान किए उनके लक्षण जैसे पाए कई साल के बाद मिली जो उसे अनोखी बात सही अपने लक्षण से पहचानी जाती हर एक जात सही लाल फूल ला, लाल फूल वाली पौधों में सदा लाल पंखुड़ी खिले बौनी पौध सदा बौनी थी बहुत पौध बड़ी से बड़ी मिले होती अतः स्वयं से चंद से होती अतः स्वयं से चंद से जाति विशुद्ध सुनिश्चित है मेंडल के प्रयोग से होता यह सिद्धांत प्रदर्शित है और एक जो प्रबलता का सिद्धांत है लाफ डोमिनेंस उसके पद देखिए आप कि जब भिन्न भिन्न दो गुण वाले नर्मादा आपस में मिलते तब है संकर पैदा होते हम इसे संकरण है कहते मंडल ने इसे ध्यान में रख मंडल ने मैं बस बंद करता हूं उसके बाद मंडल ने इसे ध्यान में रख पर सेचन की सोची बात लाल फूल वाले पौधों से धवल फूल वालों के साथ इसी तरह लंबी पौधों को बौनी से संकलित किया हरी जात को पीली के संग मिला मिला दुष्चरित किया ध्यान रहे इस पर चेतन में स्वयं जान ही साधक था और स्वयं चेतन के पद का बड़ा प्रबलतम बाधक था अब देखे कैसे जो मानवीय प्रवृत्ति होती है प्रजनन की वो प्रदत प्रवृत्ति ही बिल्कुल पौधों में भी दिखाई देती है जब आप जो बर्ड सिलेक्शन करते हैं उसी के दो बर्ड चुनिए इसके बाद मैं बंद करता हूं आपसे कि इसके पहले ही की कोमल देखिए ध्यान दीजिए आप कि इसके पहले ही की कोमल कलिया निज आंचल को नहीं आंचल क्या होता है आंचल रखने के लिए होता है तो कलियों के आंचल क्या होते हैं सेपल्स और पेटल तो इसके पहले ही की कोमल कलिया निज आंचल को नहीं इसके पहले ही की नर नरकण मादा के मधु तन छूले कोमल कलियों के वह आंचल देता था खुद बरबस फूल रख देता हो दो पचास फूलों के नरकण अनुरोध हो गया कर दिया हाय कौमारी भंग कोमल कलिया कुछ कर न सकी हो गए बहिष्कृत पतलून के और किसी के साथ पतलू के और किसी के साथ पतलू इसी तरह से सारी कविताएं लिखी गई हैं पूरी कविता आपकी आपको रिप्रिंट करके किया हुआ है आप उसको पढ़ सकते हैं मैं अंत में चार लाइनों के साथ मंडल को प्रणाम करते हुए अपनी बात समाप्त करता हूं कि आओ हम नतमस्तक होकर उसको कर दब कर बद्ध प्रणाम करें आओ हम नतमस्तक होकर उसको कर बद्ध प्रणाम करें तन मन से दत्त चित्त होकर 
कुछ काम करें कुछ काम करें धन्यवाद बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद excellent presentation dr ram kathan singh we i'm sure like me yeah, the audience really enjoyed we don't have any questions because time is also i think we have to start the other lecture but if time permits later on and if dr ram kathan singh is available later on after bd singh's lecture then we can ask questions on both the presentations simultaneously after dr bd singh finishes his lecture dr bd singh is he there Oh yes, sir. I am here. Okay, Dr. B. D. Singh. Nice seeing you. I was looking forward to seeing you in person, but doesn't matter. <laughs> you are available at least. You, you you see, I was just talking about you before we started uh, the first lecture, and I already introduced you as an excellent book writer, researcher, and what not. You know that I have known you. for the last almost 50 years now we have been good friends and without going any details for the details about your career excellent career which you had i request you to make your presentation please thank you sir you are very generous uh Uh, um, am I audible, sir? And the slides are visible. Yes, slides are visible. Uh, honourable Mr. Chairman, sir, the other dignitaries on the dais, the galaxy of luminaries linked to the conference, physically or virtually, ladies and gentlemen, I wish you all a great. afternoon today and a meaningful participation in the conference i am delighted to be in the company of the galaxy of trail blazers like professor r b singh professor p k gupta dr balram dr mangala rai dr rana professor r k singh professor deepak pentel professor tyagi dr mahapatra dr r p sharma dr aryam singh and many others i could go on who have inspired generations of geneticists and plant breeders and continue to do so even today this galaxy also includes the likes of ashok nagendra prabhu prasanna gyanendra arun joshi and several a host of others who are youthful high positive energy uh, teachers and researchers who have been actively shaping the future of indian agriculture and also the emerging stars of tomorrow and finally the galaxy tail comprises the budding young geneticists and readers who are fast developing into the bright stars of tomorrow sir no matter how many names i take some will be many will be missed so my apologies to all of them those whom i may have missed inadvertently i consider myself extremely fortunate to be part of the celebrations of the 200th birth anniversary of the man whose discovery changed our understanding of biology said i know only few words of german and i can use few statistical tests so my arguments are based on 40 art scientific publications that i have consulted to be more precise my understanding of these documents uh i first read mendel as a msc student whatever i understood then made me his fan therefore i propose to plead for mendel malone drew a poetic profile of mendel and his piece as rose of peace in a sunny garden in a special greenhouse tended for 9 years by an increasingly fat monk 
who all along began a revolution in human knowledge. In 2015, I suggested that Gregor Johann Mendel was slightly ahead of his time, but Pierce and Branko uh, suggest that he was far ahead of his time. And I tend to agree as I think you would also agree. Mendel is an enigma to me because he is highly praised, severely criticized and even condemned sometimes by the same person. He was born in, on July 20, 1822 in Morovia near Brunn that was Austria then, now Bruno in Czechoslovakia in a poor farmer family. He faced financial and health problems. He had to leave his studies and join St. Augustinian Monastery in Brunn. And he became a priest in 1847 in the same monastery. In 1851, he joined the University of Vienna to study physics, mathematics, and philosophy, etc. He was a sincere and hardworking student, yet his performance in mathematics and physics was not up to the mark. He returned to Brunn and was appointed as a substitute science teacher in local college, where he turned out to be an excellent science teacher. But being excellent teacher does not make you pass or clear the qualifying examination for teacher. So he was disappointed had to return to the monastery where he started in his intense studies with mice. But again, the church was not happy with him. Asked to stop breeding mice, so he turned to plants, particularly the pea, which turns out to be a really um, uh, lucky uh, uh, break for most of us. Uh, Mendel meticulously planned his experiments, collected his material in 1857, grew 34 varieties out of which he selected 22 varieties after two years because they were pure and the characters they showed that could be scored easily and reliably. Um, he carried out a meticulous and detailed analysis of uh, all the previous work. And this would make a useful reading for anyone um, working in any area of plant sciences. He designed an experimental procedure that was perfect for the kind of study he did. And there has been no improvement in this design since then. He was extremely careful in execution of the experiments, including the recording of the numbers of various character forms in the segregating generations. The um, novel thing was that he applied mathematics to biological studies, which was something that biologists did not like. Uh, even Darwin thought mathematics was uh, like a scalpel in a blacksmith's shop. Um, he recognized that chance deviations could, uh, could occur from exact uh, expected ratios. So uh, he considered uh, various deviations from three is to one as uh, three is to one. And his um, interpretation of and presentation of his findings was highly insightful. Mendel was extremely lucky in several ways. Uh, his experiments concluded in 1863, and the next year, the entire pea crop in Brunn area was destroyed by pea weevil. The seven traits that he selected for his study showed monogenic control, complete dominance. Actually, in one case, the seed coat color there was partial dominance and the hybrid could be uh, uh, differentiated from pure colored seeds. Uh, this Mendel has described in his paper. He did not encounter linkages and he ran into several problem cases, but only after he had worked out the rules of his inheritance. 
Um, in terms of linkage, two genes, uh, seed coat color and cartilage and color, they are located on chromosome one. They do not show linkage. Three genes, that is part shape, flower position, and stem length are located on chromosome four. And only the part shape and stem length, they show linkage. But Mendel did not study this character pair in any detail. But then luck goes only so far. He studied phaseolus. Uh, he ran into a qualitative trait that is flower color that showed uh, multi-gene control. And two um, and characters that were quantitatively controlled, say for example, flowering time and peduncle length. He carried out experiments with hyracium and um, found a very different kind of segregation parent F1 variable, F2 uniform. So he suggested two systems of inheritance, PISOM and hyracium systems of inheritance that constituted some higher part of higher general law of inheritance. He worked with honeybees that was never published. Uh, the honeybee uh, we all know now has deployed female and haploid males. Uh, the contemporary biologists did not appreciate his findings. And after his death, the monastery burnt all the records of his experiments. Mendel presented his findings at two meetings in 1865, uh, meetings of the Society of Natural History of Brunn. Next year, the paper was published in the Proceedings of the Society, who are, which was distributed to USA, Europe, most of the libraries there. And uh, Mendel sent reprints of his paper to several scientists. Some suggest to Darwin also that was uh, never read by Darwin. The paper was cited only three times, that too only in passing before its rediscovery in 1900. Uh, some claim that Mendel grew disillusioned and died a broken man because his work was not recognized. But Malone, Malone notes that uh, about his beaver, Mendel would say to his friends gently or even humorously that my day will come. And we know that his day did come belatedly, slowly, but surely. The Mendel's paper is believed to be, have been rediscovered by three scientists, Ivories, Orens, and Juan Shermak. Some also credit W.J. Spillman of USA as the fourth rediscoverer of Mendel's larger genetics. Uh, it is um, suggested that the three rediscoverers showed only incomplete understanding of the Mendel's work and that they revised their methods and interpretation of their data in the light of Mendel's work. Hugo de Vries wanted to claim priority and he complained that uh, unfairly, Mendel was honored as the founder of genetics. Orens did not like this um, idea of de Vries. And actually Corens and Sarmat were more appreciative of Mendel's contribution and they proposed terms, Mendelism and Mendel's laws in honor of Mendel. There are some scientists who argue that Bateson was the real rediscoverer of Mendel's work because he was the one who realized the full significance of Mendel's findings to the study of heredity, cited the Mendel's work, work in full in his paper, which appeared in 1901, uh, that was one of the translations of Mendel's paper. The contributions of Mendel include that uh, he settled the uh, controversy regarding male-female contribution to progeny. He showed that the contribution was equal by both the parents. He conclusively showed that the hereditary factors are particulate, Whereas that time, most biologists thought it was uh, blending inheritance that was operating. 
Mendel formulated two laws of or principles of heredity, segregation, and independent assortment. The law of segregation um, gives to uh, is based on obtaining three is to one ratio in EF two, one is to two is to one ratio in EF three. <coughs> But this explanation is involves a number of assumptions, like uh, equal uh, proportion of gametes produced by F1, equal survival of gametes, equal success in fertilization by the gametes, equal survival of all the kinds of zygotes, single gene control of the trait and complete dominance. If any one or more of these um, assumptions fails, this will cause deviation in the expected ratios in F2 and F3. Actually, Mendel made pair crosses to the two parents to test some of these assumptions, and he found them to be valid for the cases that he had studied. Um, if there is segregation for a single dominant gene, um, uh, let's ask ourselves, which, will, which of the following ratios will be obtained in F2? Three is to one, two is to one, one is to one, all of the above. I think you all got it right, uh, all of the above, but at least two PhD scholars have approached me uh, with a question and with uh, uh, to discuss the issue of getting three is to one ratio in the F2 of an ASCOMICE because their supervisors believed it should be three is to one ratio, whereas they were getting one is to one ratio. Um, so uh, the seven genes that Mendel studied, four of them have been cloned and characterized, and even the basis of mutation in them has been determined. The seed shape is due to starch branching enzyme gene, cartilage and color, due to a protein that affects chlorophyll degradation in parts in seeds. Uh, seed coat color because of a transcription factor that affects flavonoid biosynthesis. Plant height is because of the gene that encodes GA3 oxidase 1. Um, one um, mutation is because of transposon insertion, the other, other is insertion of two uh, amino acids or two codons. And then there are G2A transitions in the next two uh, genes. The other three genes have been identified, candidate genes in one case identified, and they are uh, involved in uh, chloroplast structure in part wall, part, and um, secondary cell wall deposition in case of part shape. And a protein that affects meristem function in case of flower position gene. Um, among the things that I have talked about uh, Mendel's contribution, my own feeling is that the uh, most important contribution was the concept of gene, which he suggested was particulate. We know today that it is DNA, that it performed a function. At that time, it was production development of a trait we know that the gene today, um, we believe then we accept this, that the gene today uh, encodes a diffusible product, that the gene shows inheritance, uh, alleles remain pure and segregate. There are two exceptions, of course, we know plasma genes and paramutation, that non alleles segregate in individually. In fact, they segregate in linkage blocks, that's what we understand today that the genes mutate so that they have alternative forms called alleles. Um, but uh, we know that um, instead of two, the genes can have multiple, generally can have multiple alleles. Even Fisher noted that uh, Mendel's findings have been either overlooked or misrepresented uh, in the Initial period, Mendel's work was considered to be a repetition of the earlier work of, on hybridization, nothing new. And subsequently, uh, many argued that the Mendel's laws of inheritance are difficult to reconcile with the idea of continuous evolution. 
the um, uh, difficulty in continuous evolution according to Mendel Slash persists in the minds of some people even today. Um, Mendelian inheritance is often taken to mean oligogenic inheritance, Mendelian genetics, uh, as equivalent of genetics of qualitative traits. Mendelian ratio is often is treated as three is to one, nine, three, 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 one, et cetera, ratios. And um, for quite some time, it was argued that mental belief proposed and believed in one gene in one character. This is not actually correct. In his 1865 paper, Mendel had proposed multiple gene control, uh, multiple gene control of flower color in Fasciolus. Uh, Mendel studied seed coat color, but often uh, he is um, he is said to have studied flower color. For example, the NCERT books list flower color as one of the seven traits studied by Mendel. Even Wikipedia lists the same. Even the title of Mendel's paper is usually mistranslated as experiments in plant hybridization, whereas it should be correctly translated as experiments on plant hybrids. Several studies have attempted to compare Darwin and Mendel. Um, there is ample evidence to show that Mendel read origin of his species. He also had collected other books of Darwin, and, um, but there is no definitive evidence that Darwin ever read Mendel's paper or was familiar with his findings. Um, Fairbanks reports that Mendel accepted the tenets of Darwinian evolution. He was not opposed to the idea of evolution. But while privately pinpointing aspects of Darwin's views of inheritance that were not supported by Mendel's own exper experiments, these ideas, pangenesis, role of pollen, influence of environment on heritable variation, Mendel did not agree with them. And so he noted that on the book that he studied. Uh, Rama Singh has suggested that neither Mendel understood the evolutionary significance of his findings or the problem of genetic variation, nor would Darwin have understood the significance had he read Mendel's paper. Mendel in his original paper introduces the problem of inheritance as that inheritance studies seem to be the only proper means to finally reach resolution of a question regarding the evolutionary history of organic forms, the importance of which must not be underestimated. Even Fisher noted that Mendel recognized that the study of inheritance has a special importance in relation to evolutionary theory. Mendel did not speculate about uh, the uh, meaning of his findings to evolution because his preoccupation was to demonstrate general validity of his principles. And also uh, because Darwin was a person who theorized beyond the limits of available supporting data, but Mendel never allowed theory to transgress the limits of available experimental evidence in fact, Mendel called himself an empirical worker, not a theoretician. Um, some argue that Darwin should be regarded as the father of genetics because he proposed the first genetical theory of pangenesis, and also because uh, he clearly described almost all genetical phenomena of fundamental importance. The controversy surrounding Mendel has el elements of brilliance of human mind, human fallibility, misinformation, misrepresentation, and downright slander. The much has been written about controversy, which Rama Singh summarized into three questions. Did Mendel falsify data to fit expectations? This is the first criticism and the most damaging criticism of Mendel. Did Mendel have clear ideas of particular, particulate hereditary determinants, segregation, and independent assortment? 
Did Mendel understand the significance of his findings for a species transformation? Uh, a species transformation then was um, back cross used to convert one species into another, our production of alloplasmic lines as we know today. And was he against the descent with modification, that is Darwinian evolution? Even the, the purpose why Mendel carried out hybridization work has been questioned or put into controversy. The textbooks note that it was for understanding inheritance. Fisher felt that uh, Mendel already had developed the theory of inheritance theoretically, and he wanted to only demonstrate that his theory was valid. Olby suggested that it was to see if F1 could develop into a new uh, species. But uh, recent analysis by Van Dyck, et al., um, Ellis and co-workers actually, uh, suggest that Mendel was essentially engaged in plant breeding activity. And from that, the genetics work emerged um, as a consequence of that work. But the first analysis of Mendel's data, chi-square analysis, was done by Weldon in 1902. This was followed in 1936 by Fisher's detailed analysis um, of reconstruction of Mendel's experiments and chi-square analysis. And he concluded that there was data falsification. The Fisher's paper remained largely unnoticed till um, 1964 when De Beer drew attention to it. And that was the centennial celebration year of Mendel's paper. During the next 43 years, 50 publications focused on this controversy. The chi-square analysis showed that the um, Mendel's data were more close to the expected ratios or expected values than it would be, it would be expected by chance. Uh, if uh, a number of exper similar experiments are carried out, the chi-square values are expected to show a normal distribution. The chi-square values from Mendel's data are confined to the lower side of this normal distribution. And Fisher argued that the F3 data of Mendel are the most suspect. And he suggested that the data were falsified most likely by some assistant The chi-square values have been explained um, by following two approaches. One is to suggest various reasons why the chi-square values were low. The second is uh, the method of Hillis et al. Detailed and elaborate reanalysis of the Mendel's data for chi-square. And to show that uh, the method of aggregation and combination of the data created artifacts of anomalous chi-square distribution that it was not real actually. The um, reconciliations that have been suggested, uh, one is by Pierce and Branco. In simple terms, what it means is that the experimenter repeats an experiment more than two or more times and selects for reporting only that experiment that shows close to the expected ratio of observed values. So uh, <clears throat> that way, all the experiments would have been chosen that way so that the data are close to the expected values. The question about F3 data is that the, in F2, the homozygous dominant and heterozygous dominant should be in one is to one is to seven ratio, then one is to two. And this was calculated based on the probability estimation because Mendel grew 10 seeds from each plant from 100 F2 plants with dominant character to assess the F2 ratio. If you 10 plants are grown, then the probability that all 10 will be 
of dominant phenotype, even if the plant was capital A, small a, will be three by four raised to the power 10, that is zero, five, six, three. This ultimately would work out to a ratio of one is to one is to save seven for homozygous dominant and heterozygous dominant. Yet Mendel reported data close to one is to two. Novitsky has carried out um, detailed analysis of this um, uh, probability calculation. And he suggests that if plant loss that Mendel had reported could be taken into account while calculating the probability of the homozygous and heterozygous dominance in F2, the ratio would be closer to one is to two than one is to say one as calculated by Fisher. And um, Elise et al. in 2019, as I said, they carried out um, very extensive analysis of chi-square um, um, chi analysis of Mendel's data using various permutations and combinations of the data. Um, I am no one to uh, suggest uh, comment on the validity of this analysis, but I will only share what they concluded from this analysis. They concluded that the uh, deficiency of chi-square values in a particular range depends on the way the segregation ratios are combined and disaggregated. Therefore, the proposed deficiency of chi-square values in the case of Mendel's data appears to be more an artifact of the way that last analysis aggregated the data rather than problem with the actual data. Um, from a layman's point of view, uh, let me share with you that statistics, there are various ways you can look at statistics. Um, the way I look at it is, uh, it is the um, applied branch of mathematics that crucified saccharin. But few years later, it, statistics itself got saccharin off the hook. So for me, a statistical test only suggests an estimate of probability. It neither offers an explanation for that probability, nor prove or disprove any explanation that is offered by the experimenter. Um, two other things that um, many people have pointed out like done, that if there was a person who was uh, fond of uh, falsifying data, would he report uh, data like this? Mendel reported extremes in the distribution of both seed traits on one plant in two F2 populations. Um, for seed shape, there were 43 round seeds and only two wrinkled seeds on one plant. 14 round seeds and 15 wrinkled seeds, seeds on another plant. And same situation was with the yellow green seed color 32 yellow seeds and only one green seed on one plant, 20 yellow seeds and 19 green seeds on the other. If Mendel was keen to show conformity with the expectation, why would he report data like this that raised suspicions about what he was reporting? Further, would he report that the flowering time was intermediate, not uh, resembling one parent? That the flower color in uh, Fasciolus was a multi-factor control system, not one gene control? That in Hieracium, there was variation in F1 and uniformity in F2, yet he reported these data. Um, now I reach a danger zone one does not raise an eyebrow about genius so long as one is not possessed by societal tendencies. But as advocate of Mendel, I should proceed. There are four statements or issues in Fisher 1936 that seem to be inconsistent with his genius. Fisher lamented that Mendel did not use uh, the test of significance of deviation of his ratios. But uh, a statistical genius like Mendel would surely have known that Mendel did not 
have statistical methods available to him for carrying out the kind of test that was expected of him because only in 1901 chi's square test was developed as i understand then the second point is that uh, mendel reported plant loss of 6 to 7% um but fisher did not consider plant loss in his calculations particularly in relation to the 1 is to 2 ratio that i pointed uh, showed earlier uh, had he considered this plant loss um uh, no as novitski argues that the uh, expected data should have been close to 1 is to 2 and not as 1 is to 7 uh, the third issue is that uh, consistently fisher uses flower color as a trait studied by mendel whereas mendel had clearly mentioned that he had studied seed coat color and this flower color used by fisher has created quite a confusion I, as i mentioned that many believe that mendel had studied flower color even ncert books list flower color as one of the studied traits i also earlier suggested that uh, fisher suggests that um, mendel had first worked out the genetical system of inheritance theoretically and he claims that any modern the modern genetical system could have been inferred by any abstract thinker in the middle of the 19th century and that mendel developed this theory and then carried out experiments to demonstrate his theory he for goes on to suggest that uh, his such above suggestion comes out of a study of the development of darwin's ideas Uh, but let me point out sir that uh, charles darwin was a superb abstract thinker no one would question that he was a genius he had observed dominance in f1 2.4 to 1 ratio in f2 in snapdragon and he had written a complete book on all such cases he had assumed particulate inheritance that is pan genes but yet he proposed the theory of pangenesis in 1868 the four statements or issues that i noted do not add to the merit of the thesis or the arguments of fisher 1936 then why are they there uh, i do not know the only suggestion i would um, like to make is that human fallibility is all pervasive then uh, mendel did not visualize pair factor concept this has been argued by many including rama singh uh, because uh, the reason for this is claimed to be mendel represented parents as capital a and small a and not as capital a and capital a and small a and small a the actual fact is that in his paper mendel reports f2 as capital a oblique small a and so on the oblique line uh, separating the male and female contributions and then he sums up as a plus 2a small a plus a but he does note that one homozygote is capital a capital a the other is small a small a so uh, this is uh, unfounded allegation that is made against mendel and then it is also suggested mendel did not have an idea of particulate factors and of segregation mendel clearly states that the differing ones that is factors or elements reciprocally segregate themselves during gamete formation and von dyck et al uh, agree with uh, or interpret this to mean that his precision deduction of paired elements uh, to break up their association and separate into different daughter cells is what makes him the founder of genetics my uh, thought is that uh, when we read mendel we should read him carefully and interpret him in the context of mid 19th century 
and not in the light of the current knowledge. Um, many small issues um, like translation of Mendel's paper seem to have contributed to the controversy. There are three English translations of Mendel's paper, Fisher, and most of us have used the Drury Bateson translation, which is suggested to have serious flaws. And Fairbanks and Abbott, um, who have who have published the recent most translation of Mendel's paper in 2016 in Genetics, they suggest that some aspects of Mendel Fisher controversy may be attributed to this translation. Uh, scientists like Franklin suggest that Aldo Fisher concluded that the data, uh, most uh, if not all of the experiments have been falsified. Uh, Fisher was generous to Mendel because he praised Mendel for publishing experimental researches conclusive in the results, faultlessly lucid in presentation and vital to the understanding of not only one problem of current interest, but of many. But sir, if you shower on a person rose petals and mud, the mud sticks. And just as broken windows attract antisocial elements in the neighborhood, mud attracts filth. The statistical criticism has triggered a free fall howl, leading to suggestions that Mendel failed to articulate segregation he had no clear idea of particular inheritance, that he does not deserve to be recognized as father of genetics, that he was one of the great fakes of science, and said uh, he is suggested to be one of the betrayers of the truth. Uh, also, um, mud diverts the attention to other things. Mendel is generally not credited for the idea of gene interaction that he has suggested for flower color in Fraziolus. Mendel had offered a genetic explanation for replacement of the non-recurrent parent genome by that of the recurrent parent in a backcross program uh, that is species transformation. And sometimes even the seeds of gene, gene concept are not credited to Mendel. The Elise et al. have concluded that the statistical criticism of Mendel's data has been a pernicious feature of the discussions of his work and has done great damage to the reputation of one of history's most insightful biological scientists. But on a close examination, the claims against Mendel appear to be false in their own terms. As Galib said, Sir, Fisher suggested that uh, the probability that Mendel would have got all his data that he reported uh, in actual fact is one out of 2000 trials. My argument is that, that even one in 2000 is that the probability for getting that combination of data is there. An extremely low probability may suggest, but not prove fraud. This brings to my mind my BSc examination where I was cutting a section of white rust of brassicas. Um, the sections I cut were atrocious, in desperation, I put one section on the slide and focused the microscope. To my utter surprise, the uh, section that came into focus was so thin and so uniform that my teacher did not believe it was cut by me. He checked the store records for the presence of all permanent slides. Fortunately, uh, no slide was missing, sir. And more fortunately, my teacher did not ask me to repeat the performance because never before and never after I had cut a section, even with a microtome, that was anywhere close to the one that I got on that day. So my teacher suspected 
verified and did not crucify me. My only worry is, even if Mendel was given a chance, would he exonerate himself from the charges that were leveled against him? In the end, sir, as Pierce and Branko summarize, but there are no errors in Mendel's laws, or are there? So why are we worried? Uh, to sum it up, Mendel has, does have um, people who admire him, like Howard. Mendel's rational experimental analysis of the inheritance of unit characters is without a question a work of great genius. One reads is still with the same sense of breathlessness, excitement of irresistible intellectual force and forward propulsion that one experiences, for example, from the extraordinary nature paper by Craig Brenner, Barnett, and Watts Tobin on the encoding of proteins. With this, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I rest my case. Thank you. And some excellent reading. Thank you, sir. I enjoy myself listening to this important presentation because Dr. B.D. Singh has done a thorough study the way Mendel's work has been criticized or appreciated. I myself being a student of genetics has never done such a thorough study of the criticism or appreciation of Mendel's work and therefore I cannot really make much comments on the comments which Dr. B.D. Singh made but if you have any question I will talk a little bit about it in my presentation tomorrow. Therefore, I don't want to talk any details right now. But if you have any question for Dr. B.D. Singh. Yes. <laughs> Please. A bit loud, yeah. No. See, after listening to such a wonderful lecture, my curiosity goes that there has been a human bias for criticizing men for such a case. So one should not worry actually about this. This has been going on in the Thank you. Any other yeah. comment or yes? Yes. yes. Uh, very, very well presented. I really enjoy compliments to Dr. B. D. Singh. Uh, my only question is the perhaps Mendel is the only person among the great scientists who has been, you know, persecuted after his death. Uh, Agni Pariksha, really. Uh, I don't know why uh, so much of criticism uh, he, his work has attracted. Is it because of personal reason? or Not really personal reasons. You see, in science, you can always try to analyze the data and present your views. And on the views of Fisher, then subsequently so many people try to explain why the Fisher's criticism was wrong. Therefore, in science it goes on. You see, you keep on criticizing and your uh, criticism is again criticized by somebody else. No, true. So, in, in science it I, goes on. No, no, particularly because this was something mathematical. That was, that was the primary no, but reason. Mendel was a mathematician, no, no. you see, the kind of chi-square test he applied at that particular time. So, because he was a student of mathematics, many people have written True. that the kind of mathematics which he applied to his results, nobody else could have done it at that particular time. That's exactly what I mean. Yeah. Because it was mathematical data, it could be re- He was more a mathematician and physics student yeah. 
than a biologist actually. That's why so the idea. results could be realized. Yeah. No, no, I, you see, actually, I also feel that he never falsified his results. The possibility of getting those ratios perhaps exists, but you can always keep on keep on arguing that his assistant perhaps manipulated the data because they knew too well what Mendel was expecting. That is not what. But at, at the at the site of it, if you'll see see the ratios, chi square ratio, ninety nine percent probability of every trait out of the seven traits that sometimes looks uh, very very difficult to get. But I think uh, I two think points. We are celebrating we are celebrating two hundredth birthday of Mendel just because his work revolutionized genetics and Sir. and that too so much. May I may I make two points, sir? Yes, please. B D Singh. Um, yes, please. The first point, the first point is sir, that somehow every time Mendel is celebrated, the controversy gets stronger around that period of time. Like first centenary of his paper publication, then uh, first centenary of his birthday. 150th anniversary of his paper. And now also there are a spate of research papers around the controversy. And the second point is that Fisher was a person who appreciated Mendel, criticized him, and even damned him, damned him for dishonesty. Yes, so sure. when, he suggested, when he suggested that Mendel first theoretical uh, inheritance principles worked out and then demonstrated by uh, uh, carrying out experiments. He was calling Mending, Mendel a liar because Mendel did not report this. Mendel said that he uh, did, did the experiment and then worked out the... So the same person praising, criticizing and damning Mendel. Uh, this is something I have never understood. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. R.K. Singh ne apne presentation mein Mendel ko sakti ki pujari ke roop mein uh, dikhaya hai aur sahi mein dikhaya hai. Uh, main jana chahunga unse kabhi uh, unka dhyan ispoor gaya tha kyunki unke unki jo pustak hai uske andar is tarah ki koji charcha nahi ki gai hai or uh, he is always described as uh, someone who was after inventing the truth and the God. So Dr. R.K. Singh is there online. Yes, I would like to hear. Yes, he is there. Yeah. Yes, look, I have to say that this is not the right controversy. And the first thing is that Mendel was लोग कहते हैं ना कि necessity the father of invention मैं ये कहता हूँ कि curiosity the father of invention Mendel was curious to know certain things जो चीज वो देखते थे उसका आधार जानना चाहते थे जो जो बैठित था उसके garden जो बिजता थी उसको वो देख करके surprise होते थे और उसका आधार जानना चाहते थे और उस हिसाब से उन्होंने अपने एक्सपेरिमेंट सेट किए और उनको जो भी डेटा आया उन्होंने सामने रखा और उनका जो जो डेटा जो पहले सर से पहले जो प्रिंट हुआ है और बाद में वहाँ वो रखा भी गया था वहाँ पर पूरी सोसाइटी के मित्र रिश्ते सोसाइटी में इस तरह की कोई बात नहीं थी ये तो बाद में देखिए अब इसके लिए लड़ाई शुरू हो गई और सब अपने अपने तरीके से उनको नीचे गिराने लगे वो बात गलत है लेकिन मैं जहाँ तक मैं वहाँ विजिट भी किया हूँ हमारे जो गाइड थे वो भी वहाँ गए हुए थे और बहुत इस पर चर्चा हुई है ऐसा किसी कोई उनके एक्सपेरिमेंट्स के ऊपर कोई डाउट नहीं है और ये बिल्कुल गलत है कहना कि उन्होंने डेटा मैनिपुलेट किया और मैं अपने उसके हिसाब से बनाया ऐसा कुछ नहीं था अब ये हो सकता है जैसे संजोग की बात है कुछ कैरेक्टर्स में बहुत सही रेशियोज आए कुछ में कुछ डेविएशंस भी आए हुए हैं उन्होंने सारे डेटा दिया जिसमें जो डेविएशंस दिया उसको भी उन्होंने प्रस्तुत किया है 
तो ये सब चीजें बातें कहना वो सही नहीं है या तो वो है नहीं उसको सिद्ध करने के लिए और ये तरह तरह की मैथमेटिक्स अप्लीकेशन भाई उस समय तो ये सब था नहीं जिसको अप्लाई करते और बताते कि ये ये मैथमेटिकल फॉर्मुलेशन उस पर सही उतरते हैं कि नहीं उतरते हैं अब बाद में आप लगाइए उस पर लगे या ना लगे ये आप जाने लेकिन उस इस तरह की बातें कहना कि उन्होंने मनिपुलेट किया डेटा को और पहले उन्होंने पहले से ही रिजल्ट सोच लिया था उसके अनुसार से डेटा तैयार किया ये सब गलत है इसके बारे में तो मेरी जितनी भी जानकारी है या जितना भी डिस्कशन हुआ है जर्मनी में जो उनके जानने वाले लोग हैं कभी इस तरह की बात नहीं आई थी मंडल ने ऐसा कुछ किया था ये गलत है थैंक यू डॉक्टर राम कटन सिंह आई आई एग्री विद डॉक्टर राम कटन सिंह बट आई विल मेक सम कमेंट्स इन माय प्रेजेंटेशन टुमारो आई डोंट वांट टू मेक दोस कमेंट्स राइट नाउ ठीक है सो थैंक यू थैंक यू थैंक यू वेरी मच बोथ द स्पीकर्स एक्सेलेंट प्रेजेंटेशंस एंड नाउ आई पास ऑन टू द कोच हियर फॉर द नेक्स्ट टू प्रेजेंटेशन yes i did not know we have a break now for tea for tea yeah and we return what time 15 minutes break 15 minutes break for tea and we return at 3 o'clock or 2:45 3:45 yes. 3:45 10 minutes only ठीक है
So good afternoon, friends, again, and uh, thank you, organizer, for giving me an opportunity to co-chair the session. Uh, we have two speakers in this uh, after tea session, and uh, both are in person, present here. One is Dr. V. P. Sahi. I'd introduce both speakers together, as did by my chairman. Dr. Sahi is a graduate from Manabad Agriculture Institute, Deemed University. Now it is uh, Sam Gautam uh, University of Agriculture Technology. He is MSc Plant Breeding in Genetics and PhD from DNU. He did a lot of uh, postdoc research, I see almost uh, from 2012 to 2021, and traveled widely to Korea, Czech Republic and Japan, different labs he has visited and have a very wide experience on various facets of genetics, including molecular biology. Presently, he is the head of Department of Genetics and Plant Breeding at the SHUAT Prayagras, India. Uh, he has published many research papers and uh, review articles and uh, being honored by visiting scientists to Bonn and also a scholar, uh, Japanese government for PhD. And he has been a distinction to cite uh, many subjects like animals and agronomy in his career. He'll be speaking on before and after Mendel's birth, a revisit to the contemporary history. And uh, our second speaker is Nazar <laughs> Hyatt, works with the Biocrop Science India Limited in the capacity of APAC corn product development lead. In the last 50 years, he had played many roles in Cargill Seeds, Monsanto, Bayer, and he had led the contribution to the launch of some of the widely cultivated maize hybrid across APAC countries, namely India, Pakistan, Thailand, Vietnam, Philippines, and some of the permanent hybrids like DKC 9108, 8122, many things. Dr. Hyatt is mentored young and talented and groomed them to own wires, purpose, science for better life and contribute to health for all and hunger for none by delivering breakthrough innovation to smallholder farmers. 
He also serves as a member of the board and trust of 130 year old charity organization in Karnataka, which provides boarding and education to destitute children. He'll be speaking on maize genetics and breeding classical to modern. So these are the <coughs> introduction of two speakers and now we request Dr. Sahi to please come on the dice and share his views. Dr. Sahi. Very good evening to everyone. Uh, it's an honor and a privilege to be here amongst a galaxy of, you know, scientific stars. So uh, I would like to, at the outset, I would like to thank the organizers and especially uh, my teacher and uh, former senior Dr. K.K. Vinod sir and Professor A.K. Singh sir for giving me a chance to come and speak here. So, why is it not in presentation mode? So, before I go into my own topic, I would like to continue with what, from where we left, where Professor B.D. Singh sir was talking about the controversies of, uh, you know, Mendel. So I, I did my PhD in Japan and then I went to Prague and uh, I was there for three and a half years almost and uh, then I went to Germany and during this period of time when I was in Europe and especially in those regions where genetics was, you know, uh, the study of genetics was evolving, I attended a number of lectures uh, which were interdisciplinary in nature where they, they, there were discussions on uh, uh, Darwinian theory on Mendel's laws, etc. Never did I come across, and never it had occurred to me before the previous presentation that there are people who 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 um, who oppose Mendel, and uh, because there were there were discussions of this sort in Germany also, but it was always you know uh, uh, concluded that maybe we should give some scope to Mendel, be he being a uh, 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 a mathematician and a statistician and not a biologist per se. Well, I do not want to go into those things. Uh, we are celebrating 200 years of metal and we should keep it to that. And I would like to start. So the, the title of the Symposium is Tending Mendel's Garden for a Perpetual and Bountiful Harvest. I would like to show you Mendel's Garden, how it is today. So, so I, I visited Bruno, I visited the St. Augustine Monastery. And unfortunately, the period when I visited, it was just after winters. That's why we do not have uh, sweet peas, but uh, begonias growing over there. But this is exactly the place where this is exactly the, the fields where Mendel was uh, doing his, uh, one of the fields actually in, in, in the monastery where he was actually working. So 19th century, I call 19th century as a century of biological renaissance. The reason being we have, the 19th century has seen a lot of uh, theories, what we know of today were developed or uh, evolved during uh, the, the, the 19th century. And two most important uh, people whom we see here, one being Darwin and the other being uh, Reverend Father uh, Gregor John Mendel, both of them uh, were there in the 19th century. Can you... So Darwin published his Origin of Species and Mendel published his book called Fasuke Uber Flansen Hybriden. It was actually not a book, but a paper which was read in Bruno at the National History Museum and rightly said by 
Professor B.D. Singh, uh, the German uh, word for suke is sometimes mistaken for, you know, search or other things, but it is actually um, uh, experiments. And uh, Uber translates to on, and it was not plant hybridization, but plant hybrids. Hybrid is hybrids. So this is something which uh, this is a little bit of German for you. So uh, people have many a times mistaken uh, this title as uh, and wrongly translated. And why I'm talking about translation and importance of translation is because in the previous talk, we discussed how translation can be misleading sometimes. So, uh, as I said, Mendel read his um, uh, paper on the, uh, on two days actually during the uh, um, uh, during the proceedings at the National uh, Society of Bruno. Uh, one was on the eighth of February, and the other was on the eighth of March, eighteen sixty-five. Here's a small timeline which I made which is related to plant breeding actually. So the story of plant breeding and I end it to, uh, um, I start uh, to the uh, 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 biblionic uh, period where people, where there are archeological, you know, um, uh, evidences which, which, which provide us the knowledge that the Babylonians knew about uh, sexes in date palms, for example. This was also known, the, the sexuality of date palm was also known by the Greek philosophers. And uh, one interesting reference while, while uh, preparing for this presentation I came was about Sharak. In, I do not know Sanskrit, so I, I cannot vouch for it. This is from an English translation, which says that Sharak was, Sharak knew about acquired characters. And I would end it there because I don't want to get into the details of it because I have not read the original text and I cannot, I cannot vouch for it. So, but definitely there's a reference about it. Then comes Rudolf Jacob, Camerer, who was called, he was the first person to, to have actually uh, 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 differentiated between the sexes in the plants. It was about uh, plant sexuality. So if you, if you see this period over here, this period is a period when the uh, scientists were uh, still looking for sexuality in plants. Then comes a period where they go for hybridization. This is followed by Mendel's, uh, you know, uh, work and further the discovery of uh, Mendel's laws by in, in 1900. So Rudolf Jacob Kammerer was a uh, was a German scientist, and uh, he he is one of the first uh, persons to have experimentally. So the, this this is uh, I lay emphasis on experimentally because before that people did have you know uh, ob did make observations, but he was the first one to have actually uh, done emasculation on um, uh, maize and proven that there, there is sexuality in plants and the, the importance of pollen in fertilization. So that was the first experiment and this was published in 1694 uh, uh, in Germany. He was from Tübingen University. Now, a very important aspect, I have spent six years almost in this garden. Now, it's not because I have spent six years in this garden that I'm showing a picture of this garden. The reason I'm showing, showing this picture of this botanical garden is because this is where Joseph Kohlreuter was working. Joseph Kohlreuter, it is very surprising. I, I get surprised that um, whether it was uh, Kohlreuter or whether it was, uh, I mean, th there, there have been, I can, when I come to the next slides, you'll see a lot of these scientists were in and around uh, the Black Forest, the, the region south of Frankfurt now. And uh, this is exactly where, uh, Paul Reuter was uh, doing his uh, experiments and he did his first experiments on on um, um, Nicotiana tobacco uh, plants, the first hybrids which he had developed. So uh, Paul Reuter was born in 1733 in the Black Forest in a small village called Sulz and he went to uh, Russia to study and he was appointed also as a professor in St. Petersburg and the reason why he joined there was because that time there was because the church was completely against 
the church at that time was completely against sexual study of sexuality in plants because that was that was uh, kind of blasphemous and not moral that is how it was so uh, but russia somehow my presentation is gone so R R russia uh, was moving into more of science and there was a competition about uh, finding out if if sexuality existed in plants and Col colroiter won that prize and that probably started the idea of genetics and plant hybrid if not genetics at least for plant hybridization experiments So this is this is Colroyter's experiment where he crossed Rustica and Paniculata, uh, and uh, as you can see, this is the flower which he studied, and he also made a kind of a a, a, a table where he was uh, describing the he was measuring and he was also calculating with numbers. Although he did not reach to a level as Mendel did, but he also did some uh, numericals on uh, on his hybrids, and. This was the result. So the idea was, the idea which he hypothesized was that if the pollen, because till that time people were still struggling about sexuality of plants, they were struggling about the mode of fertilization. They there were studies which had already started to you know uh, to show that insects were important for uh, for uh, plant hybridization or or crossing or fertilization, if I may say. He hypothesized three things. One was, if the pollen is not inheriting, then the offspring should be like the mother. Second thing which he, uh, he suggested was, he, which he hypothesized was, if he, he could find or if he could show that the pollen is the only inheriting factor, then the offspring is like, it should be a father, sorry, there's a mistake over there. And if there is a mixing of the sexes, that, that means if there is fertilization happening like animals in plants, then the offspring is in between. And this is exactly what happened when he crossed uh, Nicotiana rustica and uh, Nicotiana paniculata. And as you can see, the, the, the hybrid is in between the two parents. And Colreuter proved that there, there was sex in plants and this won him a position at uh, St. Petersburg where he went and later on in his life he returned back to Karlsruhe and he al also started doing his uh, you know further experiments in plant hybridization and uh, also uh, he retired uh, actually he was thrown out of the botanical garden because of some controversies with the head gardener and he did not listen to the head gardener so uh, that and with that uh, ended his career in uh, Karlsruhe. But what is important is that there were people after Kohlreuter, like uh, Christian Konrad Sprengel, again a German, and who was looking into, who was fascinated by a flower shape and size. And he, stu he studied dichogamy. He was the first one to actually report dichogamy. And there were, there were, this is just a couple of examples from Germany, which I am telling about which I had first hand information. But there, there is a period of before Mendel or even uh, uh, I, I, if, I, if I can say before Mendel's birth, where people were, there were a lot of observations and reports about uh, plant sexuality, flower shape, flower sizes, importance of pollen and fertilization. So again, this, this was a, a British uh, scientist, botanist, Thomas Andrew Knight. He, he experimented on bees and he was he is supposedly the first one to have reported a sort of dominance, which was uh, in the piece, uh, the color of the pea seed and the dominance which he reported was gray seed coat over white. He was also in his experiments, he made back crosses and in his experiments, he concluded about something which we call today as dominance. He was calling it as uh, giving a name of superiority. Uh, Seton Goss, Seton, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor R.K. Singh, sir, was uh, uh, 
citing Seton in, in the flowers. Uh, and Seton, Goss, and Knight were predecessors of Mendel. And they simultaneously, it is, it is, a, uh, it is quite surprising that uh, all three of them reported their findings in the transactions of the Horticultural Society of London in 1824. And all of them, all three of them worked on segregation. And uh, they, of course, they did their experiments and their conclusions were reported. At, uh, they found the reports or they made the reports in different dates, but it was published in the same journal that was the Horticultural Society of London in 1824. This period led to a lot of, uh, you know, innovations in uh, plant, uh, plant hybrid uh, production of plant hybrids and flowers were one of the most fascinating things which these uh, scientists were working on. One example being of William Herbert, another English botanist who did a lot of work on crossing flowers to develop new varieties. One of the reasons why uh, why uh, flowers were more in demand and why flowers were uh, so became so important for these people was at that time in Europe was ruled by royalty. There were royal families and every gardener would be very excited or a gardener those days were not like you know those gardeners had botanical knowledge and they would you know present these uh, new hybrids new color combination uh, flowers to the queen or the king and that would give them some award so that was also that of, of uh, these uh, this this uh, development of hybrids and new 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 flower types So after this period, when uh, when flowers were, you know, uh, people had already reported a number of times about uh, this uh, about sexes in plant. Can can we go back to the previous slide? One more. Yeah. So uh, there, there's a period of uh, in uh, in um, in history of science. There's a period, especially in the history of plant sciences where people started making a lot of hybrids and one of the uh, form, uh, former persons after Kohlreuter who was who was actively involved in it was the Gartner family. So uh, Joseph Gartner was the father, he was the botanist and his son was involved and they belonged to a small town again in Black Black Forest in, in southern Germany. So which is very surprising that there are five or six of these people whom I'm reporting and they all come from within 100 to 200 kilometers of area in, in southern Germany. So the Karl is a small town. I visited that place and there's a garden which is dedicated to this Gardner family. And Karl Frederick Gardner did number of replications uh, in, in number of crosses. He, he took many species for his studies and he was he even published a, a book which the title of which is Fasuke und Biobaktum over the bastard zaygun. Now that word is a very bad word in today's world when we when we look at it. But that time in those days, so the word the word which is here bastard, I'm sorry to say that. It has the, the reason why this word is used and not hybrid or anything else is because bastard in those days meant something which was out of God wills. That was not God's will. This was man-made thing. So God's permission was not there. That is why this bad name was given to these F1s. So that is the, uh, that, that there's some, uh, some uh, uh, you know, uh, etymological uh, uh, reasons for, for using this and, and of course religious. So that was the reason why uh, uh, the, the church would not accept it and the church forced sometimes people to use such languages so that people are not get, do not get carried away and they know that this is wrong. So anyhow, so Gardner was the first one who realized the importance of hybrids. He even talks about in his, when we translate the German version, it says luxuriance, which is, uh, you know, the uh, superiority or, or, the, or the vigor of the hybrids. And he is also supposedly uh, have, uh, he is supposedly reported that the importance of agriculture, uh, of hybrids in agriculture. So that is the one of the earliest references which we find where uh, a, a, a researcher is talking about the importance of uh, hybrids in agriculture or a practical importance. 
and after this was the period when uh, uh, mendel came and mendel has uh, quoted gartner and uh, mendel had read his paper uh, professor uh, professor bd singh sir was talking about references being made to mendel's work before 1900 when i was doing my uh, when i was preparing this slide i found uh, about one two three, 11 references to mendel mendel's work before 1900 and these are uh, these are mostly published in uh, german language and the most important one being of karl korens in 1899 so uh, i'll come to karl korens later but before that i want to also talk about a little bit about karl nageli karl nageli was a contemporary of mendel and they exchange a lot of letters even nageli is reportedly uh, said to not have understood what mendel was talking about because from the letters you can but he did not outrightly negate mendel and he did not outrightly dump mendel or say bad about him or say that it he has falsified they were trying to converse there was no social media they had to uh, depend on uh, letters and you know uh, it took days for uh, letters to reach each other but there is a collection of letters which exchange between mendel and nageli which clearly point uh, to the fact that uh, the concept which mendel was giving at that time was so difficult for people to comprehend that he, his own letters were not being understood by scientists like nageli so we can very well understand how the situation might have been in those days now well mendel had said and it is it is quoted that he had said that my time will come mera time aayega and that time came in 1900 when uh, hugo du bereis karl korens and schemack and again karl korens and schemack were also from germany and uh, karl korens had actually done his experiment before uh, hugo du bereis but he was late in publishing maybe he was procrastinating i was that time there was no uh, necessity for publishing published or perished so he was waiting to publish and maybe he would have waited long unless uh, hugo du bereis published so uh, actually the fact that karl korens was a big supporter of mendel is very true because this i have come in many lectures that hugo de veris was not very happy about mendel being made the father of genetics and it was korens actually not schemack but korens actually who made it a point that mendel should be made the father because the idea was his and with that uh, we have the father of genetics as mendel thank you very much thank you rob sahi and uh, please take your seat and maybe we'll take questions at the end of the second presentation so now i invite dr hyde to please
Oh, apologies for the delay. Uh, Honorable Chair Dr. Ike Gupta, Co Chair Dr. Rana, and uh, my fellow speakers, legends of science, professors, teachers, and the distinguished guests. I bring Good evening and greetings from Bayer Crop Science. And I'm here to take, share about the Bayer's purpose for agriculture. Thank you. Apologies again. Buyer's purpose is about having science for better life. And that's the reason we are here today presenting to you how the science of genetics could impact the life of the future. And why we are doing this, and we want to do this to bring about health for all and hunger for none. And why hunger for none? Today, if you look at the, the numbers that we have in front of us, United Nations projected the populations to be over 10 billion by 2080. That's a big concern because we have the limited land, land doesn't expand. We have global warming impacting the environment, glaciers are melting, the sea levels are rising and therefore forcing us to deliver more with less, which means we need to bring more efficiency in our day-to-day -day work life so that we will bring more food with the limited resources that we have. So ladies and gentlemen, with this purpose, I'd like to talk about how the science of maize breeding has evolved and what we are doing at the Bayer Crop Science. And I wanted to pay more focus on the short corn uh, that we are experimenting with um, today. It's not commercialized yet, but that's where we are thinking about combining both innovation and sustainability. I would also talk about briefly, many of you know about most of these perspectives and the conventional breeding and maize conventional breeding as well. I'm not going, going to go into details of it, but what I'm gonna present is more on the short con, what we are doing, how it will help our dreams come true. That's the hope that we have. If you look at the global scenarios today and the food that we eat today, it has not just come on its own. Is it because of maybe drag? Okay, 
Sorry for that uh, inconvenience. Today again, when we look at the food that we eat, it comes from years of the sweat and blood that the scientists and scientific community has shed in order to give us the food that we eat. I'm not going to go into details of this, but I'm not an expert in the watermelons, nor am I expert in the mustard. So in the meantime, I just want to go ahead with our objective is to understand what had gone in between you know, 350 years of experiments and improvement, evolvement in watermelons. Today, we can enjoy seedless watermelons from the less pulp that is there 350 years ago. And similarly, we have in corn, we have in uh, you know, other crops, I just gave an example of uh, the mustard there and how the brassicas have come up. And then continuing with the perspective of how the science have, you know, impacted agriculture and the innovation in agriculture with making us deliver more with what we have that's less resources. And this is the field that you can see, it's actually planted in Illinois, US, in one of our uh, demonstration plots. 19, com to compare 1940s to 9 2019 and what we are going to have. If you look at the, 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 the layout of this, it required to produce 250 kilos of corn. It required almost close to 1347 square meters of land in 1940. And th those are the days when we had open pollinated varieties. We also had, you know, reed elodents. Those are the primitive land races that were utilized to develop the land and grow it and cultivate. And later, the herbicide evolution has come into existence. So there were atrazine and some other herbicides that were used and added to this same and improved the productivity. And if you look at in 2000, that was the era of uh, the trait, the biotic trait that was launched in the US that is Roundup Ready. So herbicide that will kill all the weights and well, but the crop will remain intact and therefore impacting the yield. And that further led to in 2018, 2019, the application of uh, disease shield to protect uh, the crop from various diseases and pests. And that has contributed to the yield. What we understand from this is about, you know, how we can deliver more with less and genetics alone wouldn't be able to do that. And today is the era that we talk about public-private partnerships. We have collaborations among private companies in order to deliver this. Bayer itself has collaborations with various companies across the globe in order to constantly innovate new, way, new ways of uh, making agriculture more efficient and deliver more for the future. So that's the lesson that we learn from here. Oops. 
sorry, it's not. Like, as I was listening to the, the conversations around the previous presenters, uh, the several lessons that flashed into my mind. First of all, had Sir Gregor John Mendel not paid attention to the minute details of that round and wrinkled seat and the seat coat, today we wouldn't have been exploring all those details, which means the lesson that I learned was that we need to pay details to the minor things that we see in our day-to-day -day walk of life as scientists. And that has impacted after 200 years, we are celebrating the birth bicentenary of Sir Mendel is because of the attention he paid to the minor details. And we were also debating and talking about the, the appreciation and criticism. And today is the era that scientific community, the individual scientists challenge each other and then for the betterment of the society. We challenge each other. It's a constructive criticism and it is good to have if it is a healthy and then that gives us opportunities to deliver more, innovate more and uh, be more successful in our deliverables. I just wanted to give you a brief perspective of the conventional breeding, how it was done before. Primarily in the, in the, the difference between the current and the previous breeding was about you know, the process change. In the past, we had about you know, a pool of germplasm and then we had our breeding methods to follow. Then we focused on the collection of germplasm, exploring that getting it adopted to our growing conditions, making selections, crossing, testing, and advancing. And that was then post advance advancement, we have thought about you know, where this product can and how this product can benefit our growing smallholder farmers across the globe. But today is not that. Today there is at each and every step, there is application of uh, data science and analytics. Today is the era, even before we make a cross or a developmental cross, we utilize the historical data and that complex data is converted into the simple uh, algorithms that tell us, okay, you don't need to go for 100,000 population. You just need, if you are breeding for a particular market, you need just specific uh, you know, populations that you need to go ahead with. And that's the era that we are in today. We have origin predictions, and then every stage of our line development process, we have analytics and data science helping us with a lot of opportunities to select from. So both the selection and the rejection go together while we focus on the efficiency. And that is exactly what I wanted to bring into this, this slide. The crossing is about the parental line, population development. And then once the population is developed in the subsequent slides, I will talk about how the traditional breeding has been working. And then the testing is the key. You know, the data that we generated from our test plots, each test plot matters because that's the key for taking the right advancement decisions. If the data is wrong, the famous saying garbage in, garbage out. So we take right advancement decisions if our data is right. And if we have get, if we have tried getting rid of all the bad data that enables us to take the right advancement decisions. And then applying that in the realistic commercial fields. You know, many a times when you go to the farmer, farmer would say, okay, this might have performed very well in your growing conditions which are very well controlled in, under the statistical experiments. But what I need is the product that succeeds in my own growing conditions. That's the big challenge in the smallholder 
holder farming today, one farmer has irrigation, one doesn't. One farmer applies nutrition, one doesn't. So in that complexity, the stability of the product and the input response and the stress response is very, very key. So in the past, if you put a graph on the yield on one side and the risk management on the other side, most of the scientists have focused on the yield quotient without actually addressing the risk. It could be risk could be, you know, standability, lodging, green snap, or even pest and disease attack. But now the time has come that we take a cumulative approach, a comprehensive approach of putting, gaining the yields year after year through the technology, and then also managing the risk so that smallholder farmer in our region, Asia Pacific region would be able to benefit, reap the benefits of the innovation that we bring into them. It's all about plant breeders kit. The one more thought that has come into my uh, mind as we were discussing, uh, well, the previous uh, speaker spoke about, you know, it's the knowledge, understanding and wisdom that keep play a key important role we might have thorough knowledge of the in-depth knowledge of the genetics, but unless that knowledge and understanding is applied wisely to breeding crops, we would not be able to make this world hunger free. That's the big challenge that each one of us face. And that's at Bayer, we debate every day as to how we will improve the knowledge that we have gained, the data that we had, developed historically over you know, many years, how do we use that? And that's why the data science has taken a different role in changing the way that we were breeding our crops. And that's very key to us. And we have used selective breeding. We have used combination of cross breeding. Our focus though remains on the hybrid, hybrid breeding because in corn or maize that we call as commonly, the hybrids are very important and the year after year genetic gain plays an important role and genetic gain not just for yield you know as many 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 farmers require faster dry down many require you know tolerance to lodging many require tolerance to pest and diseases that we have and that's the focus that we have it's not just the yield alone and that's the reason we have that you know, team of teams concept, it's not just one individual or one company, but it's together that we are going to face the world under this current circumstances and the future circumstances. Not going in depth about uh, the, uh, the origin of maize, but just to give you a you know, glimpse of how the Teosente has become the modern corn and many of you are scientists and I'm not going to spend uh, you know, time here just to give you a glimpse that modern maize has come from the Teosente. Even today, just give you an example. If you look at the picture there, here, and today, if you go to, if you develop a product and give it to the farmers, and then if farmer sees this kind of multiple years coming from the same node, it's a big complaint. You'll end up paying compensation because farmers don't want that. Because none of the the cob that has emerged from single node develops into a, a productive cob. So we have moved away from such incidences to having a modern corn with naked kernels. You know, we have the teosinte, which is more hard coated. And then with tillers today, we don't have hybrids with more tillers. Sometimes we do get, but that becomes a complaint. So the farmer's requirement becomes the center of our breeding objectives. And uh, this is very key, how we have utilized the post domestication. You know, when human has domesticated Teosente 9,000 years ago, and then how the land races adapted to different latitudes, longitudes, and different elevations and growing conditions that has created huge diversity. And that's the reason Corn is a very interesting crop to work with because the genome was very well understood from the B73 you know, background. And then we have today a clear understanding as to how 
and where we should be going ahead with, you know, these land races that spread across the globe. Again, just a glimpse. And these are some of the examples, just put it here, how they have adapted to different growing conditions, latitude, longitudes over the years um, as the pond has grown. Just to give another glimpse of, and to also give you the perspective of classical versus modern. In the classical breeding, as I have already called out, you know, making a biparental cross uh, as a population. Now we have the female pools and male pools, and within the female pool, if you want to develop new lines out of it, we do make the biparental cross or sometimes three ways as well, depending on the, the need of the, this market segment that we are breeding for. And now in the classical world, it was just about, you know, making decisions based on the phenotypic selection. Breeder had to work morning till night, being in the field, understanding the plant, talking to the plants, and then making his own selection, his or her selection. But today we have data science helping us with the historical data analysis as to what cross needs to be made in order to make your breeding program more effective and efficient. And we don't have to spend uh, a lot of time you know, studying the or making the phenotypic selection. So we have moved away from, now we are going from genotypic to phenotypic rather than phenotypic to genotypic. That's the improvement that we are making in the modern plant breeding methods. And similarly across, now in this, in a schematic diagram, you need about six to eight years, you know, to make complete homozygous depending on the diversity of the parental lines. If they are more diverse, it will take more than eight years as well to stabilize, uh, to, make, to bring them to complete homozygosity. But we have now DH technology applied at the very F1 stage itself, in the second very stage. The moment you create a fun, you put it in that induced DH and we have completely fixed lines available. And therefore what's helping us in reducing the cycle, the crop cycle, you know, from conception to delivery to the marketplace, that is where we are heading towards. So the, the technologies that we use are helping us reduce that uh, gap and then increase in the speed to the market. So similarly, once you have at very F1 induced with DH, then we have the fixed lines and then we can make be the L into T or uh, line by line, whatever the breeding methods based on the industry's practice or company's specific practices, we can take uh, the breeding program forward. And we know that the, the basis for all this is genetics. You know, the magnitude of heterosis determines the failure and success. If you have heterosis for yield, which is positive, but negative for the risk factors, then the product wouldn't be adopted by our farmers who are facing year after year, many, many challenges. Even this year, many of the regions have not received rainfall. Some of the regions have received already floods. And these are the uncertainties our farmers have to grow crops and deliver food security to the nation. And that's the reason understanding, applying that understanding very wisely by doing the right things right way paves way for the success of the future. And just precisely speaking of the, I've already talk, touched about some of these aspects and many of you, all of you know this, you know, how the markers, the revolution of markers has changed the world of breeding, especially in pond breeding and with currently genome-wide selection, DH technology, and then precision breeding and so many other tools that we have today that we can go by the precision uh, going forward. Now we have the combination of genom genomics plus environmental component called phenomics. So when you combine genomics with phenomics, which we did not have before, now we have more precision product identification, precision product placement, and, and then bringing value to the farmers because they grow the products that we deliver to them. The phenomics is about characterizing the environment. In the past, plant breeders depended on the uh, 
genotypic value through you know, quantitative genetics, how genotype can be improved. But it's now, we cannot change the environment, but we have to breed the products that adapt well to the growing and changing environment because of the global warming that we have today. And that's the reason genomics and phenomics coupled with data analytics and predictive analytics is the future of uh, the plant breeding. And so I've just mentioned some of these technologies. We don't have to go into details of it. So with this background, I just wanted to give you a perspective of short stage con that the bio is working well. We are experimenting and we hope that short stage of corn will bring and will change the modern corn production uh, in the entire globe because it's not just about innovation but it is innovation and sustainability today sustainability is the buzzword across the globe because we need to mitigate the negative consequences of global warming that we are facing today and that's the reason we are experimenting and exploring uh, short stage across, across the globe. It's not that it is entirely new. We knew about it, but the technology that is available today, both in terms of forward breeding, and then we have um, gene editing, we have, again, you know, biotechnology, all the three technologies put together, we have uh, scope broadly open for us to explore this back again. What is this? short stage of corn. We have defined it in a way um, that is more fit to the each environment. Uh, in, in case of APAC countries, Asia Pacific countries, we have considered it to be at least 30% of the height of the normal tall corn. You know, if it is beyond that, then it becomes as tall as normal corn. The assumptions that we have is short stage of corn has very shortened internodes and therefore has thick stalks and will give better standability even when there are thunderstorms and cyclones or typhoons or hurricanes, whatever we call them. We also assume that short stage of corn will facilitate on ground equipment to be utilized, even, even manual spray. Today, once the flowering is done, for example, follow me bomb, we will not be able to spray anything once corn grows very tall because it grows nine, 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 10 feet. Farmers wouldn't be able to spray with even with the power sprayer that they have. But short stage of corn will enable the farmers to apply both nutrients and chemistry even after flowering. That's the another assumption. And it is proved as well. Then we have environmental sustainability, which is the major um, objective, because we need to sustain the planet that we are living in. We, we are accountable and responsible for that by reducing the carbon emission. So short corn does help in that as well. If you go to the developed countries, most of them use aeroplanes to you know, spray, and that brings a lot of carbon emission. And by introducing this short stage of corn, they would be able to use their own equipment. And they don't have to use aeroplanes to spray in which they have the very large land holding. And that is, these are the, some of the aspects that we are considering that, and hope that this will change the way that we are producing crops. And this will change the way that we have been growing corn. Be it nitrogen efficiency, even because of the shortened in, internodes, the overlapping of leaves can also create an environment where weeds will not be able to establish. So a limited weed chemical application to control weeds, nitrogen use efficiency and standability, and then ease of cultivation. These are the assumptions that we have and reduce crop losses we have spoken because I will show you some videos uh, where we have tested using helicopters um, to test the standability of short corn and it did give a very good result. Even in the this right side pictures that you can see what is standing is in a short corn, what has fallen is a tall corn when planted side by side. Um, I've already talked about some of this. You know, if you can see 
the two pictures on the short corn versus tall corn. Short corn can be harvested easily with the machine because it is standing and the tall corn lodging. So many of those have come from the shortened internodes. I will try to play. Uh, The first one, yeah. Yes. Hey, Vibina. Sorry for the inconvenience there. So the features that I've already spoken about, what short corn bring, we can see the advantages of improved standability, stress tolerance, increased, increased harvest index as well. You can see in this picture as how the operation at agronomic operations can uh, shift you know, what we have been following traditionally, where we will not be able to spray the tall corn that now is made possible. And uh, we have three breeding approaches that we follow. Number one, forward breeding. Number two, we have biotic approach. And number three, we also have gene editing. 
Uh, in India right now, we are following mostly the forward breeding to have uh, the short corn developed and we are in already in the advanced stage of uh, the testing. In Pakistan, we are going to launch uh, one of the short corn product in the white corn segment um, by uh, 2023. So we are making good progress even in the APAC region, uh, unlike you, uh, the Europe. And we do have to deal with different alleles. We have Mexican allele, and we also have a European allele that is responsible for uh, short corn. SD allele is the one which is which brings down the or reduces the internode length, which means what it does is it's basically it inhibits oxygen production. Therefore, below the ear placement, it condenses the short uh, the nodal length, but above the ground above the core placement, the internode's length doesn't change. But in case of biotic SD four one nine, it's which is basically a gibberellin inhibitor that condenses the internodes across the plant. I mean, both above the cob and below the cob. And that's where we have much more turgidity or the strength um, in the stock to withstand even cyclones or thunderstorms. Uh, so the gene editing approach, it's still in the infant stage. Uh, we will have solutions because there are associated problems with um, short corn because it's very, very uh, short and sometimes the cob will be just you know a few centimeters above the ground where you know the wild animals can damage and diseases like bacterial uh, leaf sheath blight, banded leaf sheath blight can impact the cob very easily. So mitigating all those risks, ensuring that the uh, the hybrids are producible so that farmers will get get benefited from this shortened height where we have almost close to five to twenty five percent crop losses today reported across the globe because of either green snap or because of stock lodging. And uh, here is the picture that you can see in the middle. Whatever has fallen is basically the tall corn. And uh, next one, I should have a video. I'll just play this. This was uh, done using the helicopters. Uh, and Chocon gave excellent results of you know, withstanding even the pressure that is created by helicopters. Uh, this experiment was done in the US. So you can also see the difference between how the conventional corn uh, behaved subject to the artificial pressure, and also we will see the short corn of it. So the, because of the, the pressure. So this is the similar pressure that we experience you know, during the thunderstorms or cyclones or even, um, even these hurricanes. So you can see that stock breakage in, in some of those plants. And with this, it's giving us a you know, hope that we would be able to mitigate some of the risks that globally farmers are facing. And this is much more um, valuable in our growing conditions, especially northern part of India, Pakistan, and Philippines, where the thunderstorms or typhoons are very, very common. And uh, this can give us a, a, a value addition way So with this, I will move on to just an application of how the transgenics have also worked with the, the genetics becoming as science. The transgenics, as you know, pro give protection to the below ground and above, above ground, along with the combination of uh, herbicide tolerance. And we have different events called NK603, which is Roundup Ready, uh, which is herbicide tolerant technology. The other one is VT double pro, which is uh, above ground pests, giving even very effective control uh, against um, you know uh, the fall army worm that we have been experiencing. Vietnam was the country where 
we had seen the clear cut differences between any other normal conventional follow me worm control versus VT, VT double pro technology that combines both Roundup Ready or herbicide tolerant technology along with the above ground pest tolerance. So just to give you a glimpse of it, in Philippines, it's the, it's the only trait um, biotech corn that they grow uh, because of all the challenges that they have. And short corn with this, uh, the traits will give much more advantage to the farmers and uh, even better control over uh, the polami worm as well. But primarily this being designed for lepidopteran pests. And that's how the genetics, the science of genetic has evolved in the modern breeding, helping us make better choices. It's all about the choices that we make using the knowledge and understanding that we have uh, acquired over the centuries and then putting it, applying it uh, wisely in order to make this world a better place for tomorrow. So with this, just wanted to thank once again, uh, the organizing secretary uh, for giving us this opportunity. I'm proud of representing Bayer in this and thanks for listening to me. Any questions I'm willing to take. Thank you, Dr. Hyatt. Uh, though we have a positive time, but still, uh, I hope there will be some question to May's <laughs> journey of traditional to hybrid breeding. So, Dr. BPC, please. It was very nice presentation. And really, I appreciate the language you have used, the slide you have shown, and the short stature base. And we know about your organization doing excellent work. Are you also working on the self life of maize grain as such, like wheat? You can store for two years, nothing will happen at room temperature. But maize, if you even put at room temperature, it generally gets spoiled. Just I would like to kindly add to our knowledge. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for that question. Um, storability is one of the traits that has become increasingly important in the smallholder markets like uh, India and some of the Southeast Asian countries. More, many of the farmers, they store for one year. Um, some of them store, you know, cobs, some of them shell and store the grain. And uh, depending on the genetics, uh, there are, there is gradual reduction in the yield when you measure after storing for a year or after even six months and two months, even discoloration and weevil infestation, all the three. So we have begun working, uh, identified that need first about four or five years ago, because some of the genetics, especially when you bring and combine um, the temperate genetics with the tropical in order to give the yield punch. And that is when these issues become much more relevant uh, in, the, in the breeding program. So what we are trying to do right now is identifying the haplotypes and that contribute to the, the grain quality and also trying to establish with the nutritional institute, institutes like NIN in Hyderabad and CFTRA and then see what grain qualities uh, are required in order to maintain the self life, a better self life. And we also have our in-house quality program because even the hybrid seed that we produce, the F1, very F1 seed, that also needs to be sold, uh, stored in the, in, the, in the cold storage. The moment you bring it out of cold storage, in case the seed doesn't get sell, sold, also will face this problem, thereby incurring huge losses to the organization. So both at the, the production level, the seed quality of self life is important. And at the hybrid level, because customer or the farmer requires it, the more longer he can store, he or she can you know, sell that produce at the right, time when the prices are high. So we are certainly working with that, sir. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, 
I have one question. So you 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 said that because of the org changes in the orgs in the, the strata changes. Now this lodging which is happening is probably because of the short strata. But is there something happening in the cell wall also? Some changes like lignifications or or, or composition of the cell wall which might be contributing towards it, or is it, is it just because of the uh, shortness? Thank you, Dr. Sahi, for bringing that. What we have understood so far is uh, the compactness of the pith that is becoming very, very important uh, in short form. That is why it is able to resist, number one. Number two, even, the, even being so thick, the elasticity also improved. So even when it is bending, it is able to retain back its original position. So these two things in the field uh, we have observed, but the molecular understanding is happening as to why it is, you know, is helping us. So I hope I answered your question. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Dr. Hyde, an excellent presentation. I just wanted to know that uh, what's the kind of difference in the population density that you can pack per unit area in case of uh, short stature corn versus the tall one and the productivity difference between the two. Thank you, sir, uh, for bringing that question. Uh, in one of the slides that I presented, I haven't talked about the population where the produce more with the less slide. There, the conventional OPV had about 12,000 population. And 2018-19, we had about 33,000 uh, plants per acre. And now with short corn, uh, we are targeting 48,000 plants per acre. So that's the density that we want to push because the reason is breaking the uh, correlation between plant height and yield in corn. It's, it's not going to be easy because taller the plant, higher used to be the yield in corn. And that's why across you know, Mexico and US, the tall corn was always preferred, but breaking that linkage and then you know, making it more sustainable with the short corn was also a challenge. So one of the uh, options that we chose is to push the density so that the yield will not be dragged. It will either remain same with all the additional um, risk management rates plus the protection. So. Hello. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, in your presentation, you have uh, talked about DH line, sir. So my question is like uh, the future population is continuously rising, sir. So uh, if we use molecular marker techniques and molecular uh, assisted uh, MAS techniques in uh, that those lines, like one is RIL and second one is DH lines. So if we apply that techniques MAS in both the populations, then uh, which is the like ideal population we will get for the future aspects like which is the like ideal population for like uh, for farmers by which we get a more food uh, in a short period of time so that was my question sir yeah if i uh, thanks for that question if thanks. i understood your questions correctly what would be the target population for future be it dh or be it um, ri right yes sir yeah thank you um what we understood from our experience, it's not about DH or any other technology. Primary, uh, the foundation that is laid by the genetic itself. If the genetic or the germplasm doesn't have the adaptability or um, it cannot be accommodated more in a particular unit area, then whether it is DH or any other technology that you apply, it's not going to uh, give us higher population adaptability. So in the past, the architecture was thought out to be, you know, uh, in, in a fundamental thing to make or to accommodate more plants per unit area. But that's not the case. It is about the genetics. See, if you look at the tropical genetics, they have broad leaves, very wide and, you know, uh, uh, drooping kind of leaves. Whereas temperate, because they are short of the, you know, uh, sunlight and therefore they have been purposefully bred to have very erect and straight angle, um, you know, genotypes. 
And that's the reason they are able to harvest more sunlight than the tropical ones. But at the same time, the difference and the interesting thing is that both the tropical genetics and temperate genetics have differences in their adaptability to high density. We thought that, you know, temperate means high density adaptability, no. We thought that short pond means high density adaptability, no. It's the combination of the germplasm that you're working with, combination of the breeding direction in which you have taken it and, and the overall purpose of accommodating increasing the population. Having said that, I would also like to bring to uh, your attention, you know, educating and transforming, changing the farmer's practices is going to be extremely difficult. The reason why I'm saying this is, you know, Mexico is a country where they go beyond 120,000. You know, they have already crossed 50,000 per acre population today. And they're both, therefore they're pushing the yields. But if you come to the countries like India, where the rain fed agriculture, they will not be able to handle even 20,000 population. Many of the states, if you go and actually count the population, you will find in reality, you know, 16,000, 20,000, maximum 22,000 in rain fed agriculture. Only in the irrigated, uh, you know, states or places, you find farmers using little more density. So it is not just about the DH or non-DH, it is about the germplasm adaptability, it is about the input management and how they have been evolved or developed or bred in order to push the targets. And then it's not about just launching product, but it's about knowledge transfer to our, our farmers who want to be benefited by this. Because the moment you push the plant density, which means you're also increasing the number of kernels that you are selling to the farmer, which means it is also raise the price uh, that farmer has to pay for those increased number of seeds or kernels. And that those are all the, the practical matters that impact the adoption of this technology of identity. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I think we can discuss later on because of time positive, because we have a dinner and culture program as well. So with the permission of chair, uh, as a co-chair, just I will take two, three minutes and then I will request chair to close the session and find the remarks. Uh, I will not uh, say anything because the people who have spoken today are the stalwarts and uh, people like Dr. V.K. Gupta ji and uh, Dr. B.D. Singh, probably scientists of my age who qualified ARS because of these two people. Because alert ki book sami mani aati thi. We used to read alert book, but alert ki bilko sami mani aati thi. All of a sudden, this, this plant breeding book came and we qualified ARS. To be very frank, had, I, had we read alert book, we could not, at least I could not have qualified uh, uh, this ARS. Only, only reason Dr. B.D. Singh's book we read for almost two months, or puri rat li thi amani. Jahan se kuch lo question. Or puri question usi mein se aai. Mere examiner mein wohi kholi thi. It was so question we answer so it was so good and your side was we read that. So really applaud to these people, those who made our life is so easy. Uh, because coming to this uh, uh, Dr. RK Singh's uh, language uh, issue, yeah, it is there. Hamlook Sandbags are pretty high. Many of Hindi medium schools are typical gowns. A PhD dekto pale, Reggie won't be pale Hindi, social and Reggie social abuse, but translate Kana Firbona. Tapta Dunia Kanaka Ponja. It's a difficult time. You can raise him Bona, but the culture as a word gag in Regime Bona. To both from Brahmushka the same are the Tepe, Sasputi, the Kahoga, Bonak Baria. We said very well, yes, we can. Think in our own language, we can think, we can speak very well, we can work very well. And take, for example, of China and all this. Some you can find some words, one, two, three, that's it. Although everything in Chinese, whole science, and where they stand. So that is, I think, he made a very well explanation of this and uh, very nicely explained the Mendel journey in a poetic language. And I said, Dr. Biri Singh, 
हमने में नहीं पढ़े थे वो आ, कुछ कुछ तो पढ़ा था लेकिन सारे जो उस पर क्रिटिसिजम और ये शो को वो नहीं पढ़े थे प्रॉब्लम दिस अ वेरी गुड स्लाइड विनोद फॉर स्टूडेंट्स समी हु जो मेंटल पढ़ा रहे हैं उनको जरूरी है पढ़ाना है बिकॉज आजकल जो सो कॉल्ड मॉडर्न साइंस में आ गए जीनोमिलेटिंग उसमें भूल गए मेंडल को एंड यूल बी सरप्राइज वेन समी यू डोंट एक्सपेक्ट नो क्वेश्चन एन आई वॉज अपेयरिंग फॉर द इंट्रो हेड ऑफ डिविजन एंड सडनली वन से सीनियर पर्सन फ्रॉम पी ए यू मेरे को पूछा कि डिफाइन मेंडल्स ला अब मैं तो परेशान हो गया मैंने कहा यार मैं डायरेक्टर हेड के इंटरव्यू देना यार मेंडल ला कहीं याद रहे अब फर्स्ट क्वेश्चन पहला क्वेश्चन में क्वेश्चन डाल दिया राणा मैं डिफाइन मेंडल्स ला and i had to think for a while here my definition is recall karni padi so that is how this basic science and basic question same time how they help and that fantastic collection dr bd singh had made and presented and it can be a, a part of your curriculum uh, and dr sahi explained how pre mandal people how they did breeding and all this and finally that hired with excellent journey and ultimately uh, translating the whole uh, mandals the traditional breeding to genomics so fantastically and uh, once again i the uh, congratulate or, or organize that re- this is a, uh, this session is really a tribute to mendel probably first time i have this kind of experience of having this kind of lectures in built and a good time on that thank you very much and may i invite now respectable chair to find his final remarks and closing the session dr gupta ji please well friends i already made some remarks about the presentations made earlier but i have some more comments to make dr ramkatin singh made a very good presentation particularly because uh, we always talk about whether or not we can teach in hindi i agree very much about the feeling of dr ramkatin singh that teaching in hindi is possible but whether or not at the university level we should teach in hindi that is something debatable in my opinion because you see indian students have a definite advantage over many chinese students when they go abroad because we are taught in english and because we can publish in english many chinese students are always handicapped because they are not taught in english and they are changing They are changing now. So at the school level, yes, we should teach in Hindi because the students can understand in Hindi. But the point is, you see, I appreciate very much the feelings of that man, Dr. R. K. Singh, that why can't we teach in Hindi? And if we have to teach in Hindi, how can we teach in the form of stories and poetry? An excellent presentation by Dr. R. K. Singh. Another thing which came to my mind about Dr. B. D. Singh's presentation. Don't you think it was an overemphasis on criticism? Because should we teach criticism to the students? It is belittling the work of of Mendel, in my opinion. As a scholar, you should read the criticism. I agree. And Dr. Bidisig has done an excellent job as a scholar, and also in his presentation. I think uh, we don't read so much about the criticism and. and then counter criticism you see the whole literature after fisher gave the criticism there are so many papers always coming some of them criticize fisher others criticize mendel and then keep on talking but you will see that mendel was very honest person in data presentation tomorrow in my presentation i will tell you that the kind of honesty which he exhibited in communicating the result which he obtained nobody can question about his honesty in recording and presenting data there is no doubt about it and therefore the students should not go with the feeling that there was something wrong in the presentation of the results by mendel this is just just a very brief comment i am not criticizing dr bd singh he has done an excellent job in studying the subject of criticism how the criticism went on and went on but uh, nevertheless we should not teach the students so much about the criticism in my opinion 
talk about what Mendel did rather than talking about the criticism. But as a scholar, as I told you, he did a wonderful job and I appreciate very much the labor which has gone into his presentation. Then the third presentation by Dr. Sai, I appreciate very much because nobody has talked about pre-Mendelian work. And pre-Mendelian work, the, the way he presented and because he, by his personal experience, visiting places and having first-hand information about the pre-Mendelian work, which I, I very much enjoyed listening to him. And he was very brief, but post-Mendelian, he did not talk because so many of us are going to talk about it. But the pre-Mendelian work, I think, I appreciate the organizers inviting him to talk about this pre-Mendelian work. And maize, we have already been discussing where is a seed company which is known all over the world. One of my students is working on rice in Bears at, at Hyderabad, Dr. Yogaraj Singh. But uh, Dr. You see about many, many things which he talked about, for example, domestication genes, then from tall to short. He did not talk too much about double hybrids and single hybrids, <laughs> but uh, nevertheless, and he also touched upon transgenics and marker assisted selection. I was reading his, his abstract where he has talked about the quantitative genetics, cultural analysis, and genome-wide association studies. All that has uh, given, you see, during the last about 30 years, these molecular markers have given rich dividends because I wish we had the molecular markers available uh, much earlier because the lack of molecular markers made it difficult for us to understand genes which became possible only after molecular markers became available. So with these brief remarks, I thank all the four speakers for today's presentation. It was an excellent session. I myself thoroughly enjoyed it. I thought it will be difficult for me to sit four hours listening to these lectures at this age, but it was not difficult at all. I enjoyed it thoroughly. Thank I request our chairman to felicitate speaker of the session with a moment as a token of love. Dr. R.K. Singh. Uh, I request uh, maybe Dr. Shailish to can come uh, to uh, receive on behalf of Dr. R.K. Singh. Sir. Yes, please. Okay. Dr. B. D. Singh. Dr. B. P. Sai. Dr. Abin Hinsar. Hi. I would now request Dr. A.K. Singh to felicitate chairman and co-chairman with Momento as a token of love. Hey, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, Now I request Dr. Kiran Kaikewad for vote of thanks. Uh, esteemed scientists on the dais and of the dais, faculty members and dear students, good evening to all. It's my privilege to have been asked to propose a vote of thanks for this session. Uh, big, big thank you uh, to the honorable chairman of this session, Dr. P.K. Gupta, sir. For, for his encouraging and timely remarks and the gracious participation. He has long demonstrated his interest and commitment to advancing the science of genetics from last 60 years. Uh, his remarks shows the scope of his thinking. Thank you so much, sir. I must mention our deep sense of gratitude to Dr. J.C. Rana, sir, co-chairman of this session for taking time 
out of his busy schedule and enlightening us with your thoughts. Thank you so much, sir. Further, we are grateful to Dr. R. K. Singh, sir, for accepting our request to deliver the lecture. The lecture in Hindi on Anuvamshi Kike Sopan, which is a poetic uh, representation of the Mendel's work, was a, uh, really a treat to watch. Thank you so much, sir. I must mention our deep sense of appreciation to Dr. B. D. Singh, sir, who is an inspiration to almost all students of the genetics. Sir, thank you so much for your informative lecture and for helping us understand Gregor Mendel's scientific contribution as well as the scientific uh, uh, controversies of criticism in a very simple way. Thank you so much. I would like to express my sincere thanks to Dr. VP Sahi for accepting our invitation to the lecture and giving us the information regarding the pre-Mendelian history as well as the scientist and major scientific discoveries that led to the genesis of genetics as a unified subject. So thank you so much. I would also like to thank uh, Dr. Ebenezer Hyde from uh, Bear Crop Science for showing us an update on this short stature corn breeding program of Bear Crop Science and telling us how the science of genetics can shape the future. So thank you so much. Uh, we all are inspired by your great words. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, once again, I want to state that we all are most grateful to all the speakers. We thank you for being with us this evening. It has been a great pleasure. Thank you so much. Now I would request uh, Dr. Harita uh, to inform the audience regarding the further program. Thank you so much. Thank you all for gracing the session. Now we'll break and reassemble again at 7.30 for the cultural evening. So we are going to have very wonderful performances by 